to the Iowa ACC. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can all hear me okay. Thank you and welcome to the Iowa ACC ECHO Virtual Boat Trip Lecture Series. Uh, this is the second weekend, the third day of the lectures. Uh, we have a, a fabulous line of speakers lined up for you. Um, along with me, the rest of the planning committee, Jay, Kofi, Roy, and uh, Autumn, we all welcome you to this lecture series. As a few reminders, uh, please keep your microphones and your videos turned off at all times. Uh, please refrain from uh, making any annotations on the screen or respect for the speakers and to, to the rest of the audience. Um, again, it's a good idea to look at general cardiology lectures. I will probably share the screens later if you have any questions about how to get to them. Uh, there have been questions about if the videos will be recorded or not. As long as the speakers give us permission, we will be recording these uh, videos and sharing them on our website. Uh, without further delay, I'll go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Uh, Joy, if you want to try sharing your screen, please go ahead at this time. Sure. Uh, Dr. Bijay Tatiliyat, he is a clinical assistant professor at the University of Iowa State Family Children's Hospital Department of Pediatrics with a focus on advanced cardiac imaging. He completed residency in pediatrics at the University of Florida, fellowship in pediatric cardiology at Duke Medical Center, and advanced fellowship in cardiology in cardiac imaging at the University of Texas in Houston. He joined the University of uh, Iowa Division of Pediatric Cardiology in 2016. He's actively involved in advanced imaging with cardiac MRI, cardiac CT in pediatric and adult congenital heart disease. He plays an active role in fellow education, leading frequent lectures in congenital heart disease, echo, CT, and MRI applications in imaging of complex congenital and acquired heart diseases. Vijay was also one of uh, the speakers on our um, uh, prior lectures from last year, so we appreciate his contributions, and he's also a good friend. Uh, over to you, Bijoy. Thanks, Dr. Ashwat, for the introduction. Uh, I would like to also thank the IOACC and also the Fellows in Training Council for organizing this event. So, I'll just start off with my uh, presentation here. Uh, I'll be covering today um, simple congenital heart disease, uh, and uh, Dr. Ashwati comes in later, will be covering the complex congenital heart disease. So, your video is, so your audio is not very clear. I don't know if there's anything you can do. Let me just uh, readjust and give me one second here. It's much better now, actually. Okay, is this better or? Yeah, is... This is much better, please. Okay, go. thank you. Thanks. So yeah, as I was uh, saying, I'll start off with uh, the simple congenital heart disease. Uh, before I start my lecture, uh, Sorry, I have no relevant financial or disclosures or conflicts of interest. So the way the lecture is going to be outlined today, um, we'll initially have an introduction to simple congenital heart disease, and then I'll go to the specific cardiac lesions listed. Initially, uh, give a brief description of the echo findings and atrial septal defects, and in relationship to that, describe partial anomalous venous return, then go on to describe uh, different types of VST, the clinical findings, and the physiology. Then again, touch on to AV septal or AV canal defects, PDA, and finally, end the um, talk with cooperation biota. The way the talk is designed is uh, Dr. Bijay, uh, Dr. Bijay, sorry to interrupt this sure. uh, background noise coming. Is there a way you can uh, turn that off or correct that? Is it any better or is it still there? Uh, your voice is much clearer. Um, I think this is this is a little better than before. So okay. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just uh, directly connected to the to microphone closer, maybe or something. Uh, okay. More effective during the recording, I think so. Okay. Is it uh, better now? This is good. Yeah. If you can. Okay. Yeah. If anything, if there is a loss of quality, let me know. I'll try to see if I can do anything from here. I'm just optimizing my audio settings. Give me a second here. Just make sure uh, there is no external. Okay. 
Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, continue. Um, so coming to the first nation, uh, so the way this uh, talk is designed is to kind of describe uh, the echo findings in most of these different relations. And then from there, um, I'll go ahead and some of the cases I might have some um, cardiac CT or MRI images just to kind of delineate the anatomy and better and for the better understanding. So coming to congenital heart disease, which forms approximately 0.5 to 0.8%, some publications even uh, mention it as much as 1% of the live births per year in the United States, of which uh, asynotic congenital heart disease forms 70% of the uh, defects, uh, most commonly the ASD, VSD, PDA, and occasionally complex obstructive diseases like aortic stenosis or co-optation. And the rest 30% is formed by the complex or the cyanotic congenital heart disease. We have approximately 1 to 1.3 million adults with congenital heart disease in the US, and the population of the adults with the congenital heart disease is growing at a rate of 5% per year. And uh, many of the defects, the way they present clinically and the way they manifest is based on the size of the defect, the location. Um, and usually most of the defects like VSD, ASD start off with a left to right shunt and eventually uh, based on the pulmonary pressures can revert and go from right to left. Um, and as I mentioned, can eventually develop pulmonary hypertension. Many of these defects are also associated with multiple syndromes like Down syndrome. We have Noonan syndrome, we have um, Williams syndrome. So I wouldn't be going too much into the syndromes today, but kind of just wanted to mention that because many of these are associated with syndromes and genetic defects. So first coming to the atrial septal defects. Uh, the commonest one, which uh, all of you know, is the patent foramen and ovale, which is a small defect between the flaps of the uh, two atrial septa, the primum and the secundum. The most commonest, of course, is the secundum atrial septal defect. And um, if you can see my cursor, it's usually located in the primum septum here. This uh, mostly it's around either the center around the cent uh, this part of the septum. And then you've got the what's called the ostium primum defect which is on the lower part or inferior part of the interatrial septum. And it's usually associated with AV canal defects. And the other ones are sinus venosus defect, which I'll come into more detail, uh, which are associated with either the superior vena cava or the inferior vena cava. And the last one is um, very rare. It's an unroof coronary sinus ASD. Usually the coronary sinus, uh, the roof, is uh, deficient partly or completely, and the is the uh, the, uh, the actually the blood flows into the left atria, causing a uh, shunt there. The co-evaluation of an atrial septal defect usually the first thing to define is the location. Um, then you go ahead and define the extent of the shunt. Um, then if there is right heart dilation, you can estimate the pulmonary arterial pressure mostly by estimating the tricuspid regurgitation. And also you look for other associated defects, like if, is there any pulmonary stenosis? Is there any VSDs or any other congenital heart defects associated with the ASD? So first coming to the second atrial septal defect, um, this is kind of a still image, which kind of shows you the left atria, the right atria, and the interatrial septum here, uh, which shows the defect. And in this case, the shunting is going from the left atria to right atria, which is a left to right shunt. And this is the most commonest form of ASD, which forms 70% of all the atrial septal defects seen. And here is a, a CINE image, which actually shows a shunting. Um, this is in a, a smaller patient where you can get a subcostal image to show the shunt. And um, again, here it is a pretty large defect, a left to right shunt on the Left atria, you can actually see all the pulmonary veins come in here and then the defect goes in through them. In adults, uh, the subcostal images may be difficult to obtain um, just because of uh, the body size. And the other option that we resort to in adult patients is trying to get a short axis view. Uh, here you've got the aortic valve in short axis. In 2D, you can see it here well. This is the left atria. Here you've got the right atria. And here is the interatrial septum, and you can see the defect with the shunting there. The color Doppler in a short axis view is not the optimal just because of the angle that you're imaging it. Uh, but um, 
it at least uh, gives us a decent idea of how it looks in 2D and the size of the defect. So in adults, the other uh, option of imaging uh, the atrial septal defects is what we do is a uh, apical force chamber off axis. Instead of being right at the apex, you slightly come more towards the right side and you can see the defect in 2D and then you can also see the color flow across the defect. And the color flow may sometimes exaggerate the size of the defect, so it's always good to initially get a good 2D view of the defect before you place uh, the color doffer on it. In this particular patient, you can see that there is right heart dilation, RA and RV dilation because of the defect. This is actually an older patient and um, we were able to get pretty decent images. Again, shows a pretty large defect with right heart dilation. And the same patient, uh, again, sometimes we are lucky to get subcostal images, which again shows the defect uh, quite well. In 2D, you can see pretty large size defect there with a left to right shunt. Uh, the next uh, uh, ASD that I'm going to address is the sinus venosus defect. Uh, there are actually two types of defects, which is related to the SVC or the IVC. If it's related to the SVC, it is known as the superior sinus venosus defect. And if it's related to the inferior vena cava, it is called as the inferior sinus venosus defect. Uh, some of these defects are associated with also anomalous pulmonary veins, and uh, most commonly the right ones. Many of the defects can be uh, hard to image by transthoracic, and we might have to do either a TE uh, or advanced forms of imaging to further define the pulmonary veins. Uh, and again, just to give you a visual idea, SVC here, and this defect is a superior sinus venosus defect, IVC, inferior sinus venosus defect. This is again a still image which shows that the SVC here has got a superior sinus venosus defect, and that overrides the interatrial septum, or straddles the interatrial septum, creating that defect. So this is a, a cine image. On the left, you see what's called a bicable view. You have this SVC over here, and the IVC down here, not well seen in this particular image, slightly off axis here. But again, what you can appreciate here is this large uh, superior sinus venosus atrial septal defect, and you can see the shunt. So when the shunt comes across the SVC, it can go both into the right and the left atrium. This was a 15 year old who initially had an echocardiogram for a heart murmur. Um, and again, was noted to have uh, right heart dilation. Uh, from the four chamber views and from the other images they obtained, they were able to uh, suspect a possible superior sinus venosus defect and to get a better idea of uh, the pulmonary veins they resorted to getting a transesophageal echocardiogram. And here's a transesophageal echocardiogram. Just to orient you again, your probe is here, the transesophageal probe is here. This is your left atria. And this is the right atria, interatrial septum. And you see this large defect, which is again the superior sinus venosus defect related to the SVC. What's also interesting in this case is you can see the, the flow that's coming in here into the same region. And these are actually the right side of pulmonary veins. Uh, that were draining at that same level. So this patient actually had partial anomalous right-sided pulmonary veins and the right upper and the right middle actually drained pretty close to the place where the SVC joined um, the atrium. Uh, rarely uh, in 5% of cases, you can have the left-sided veins uh, come and uh, drain anomalously with an atrial septal defect. Uh, you can see something called a vertical vein. So actually the left-sided veins actually join together to form a vertical vein. And this particular vertical vein actually drains into the innominate and then into the SVC. So whenever you have a suprasternal view and if you, most of the time, you should just be seeing a blue flow going away from your probe for the pulmonary artery and as well as the aorta. If ever you see a red flow that's heading towards the probe, uh, it should be concerning for a possible anomalous pulmonary vein, which needs to be further evaluated by echo or by other advanced imaging. This is some more to show one of the older patients who had um, what you see here on this side are the right side of pulmonary veins. 
and in this uh, image, uh, which is, uh, you can show it, you see it in all views. This is the IVC here, and these are the right side of pulmonary veins, which are joining the IVC. Um, and this is what uh, is previously commonly referred to as the Sinitar syndrome. The reason being on a chest X-ray, you can see all the pulmonary veins and frame creating a shape that looks more like a scimitar. Uh, in this particular patient, um, this veins are later baffled to the left atrium. This again is just an MRI to show that just like the superior sinus venosus defect, when there's an inferior sinus venosus defect, you have this large defect and you can see the IVC that overrides the interatrial septum. In this patient, the echo images were not uh, optimal. So I just wanted to give you an idea how it shows with MRI. So the presentation of ASD could be based on the size and location. You, small ASDs are usually asymptomatic. With larger ones, you can have an increased RV impulse. Um, the S2 is commonly described as fixed and split in the patients that we normally see, which are the pediatric population. The heart rates are pretty high, and usually it's difficult to appreciate a fixed split S2, but I think in the older patients, it might be better appreciated. You can have a systolic ejection murmur because of the left to right shunt and increased flow through the pulmonary arteries. You can have a diastolic rumble, secondary to the increased flow across the tricuspid valve. EKG can show first degree AV block, right bundle branch block, or right ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, X-ray, uh, in the younger patients, usually you see cardiomegaly because of the right heart dilation. Older patient, because of the long-standing shunt, you can see increased pulmonary vascularity. The management of these uh, defects um, is again based on the location and the type of defect, usually secondum defects in a good location. And the image here kind of shows you the different rims that are associated with an atrial septal defect. Um, essentially the AV valve rim, iotic rim, SVC, IVC rim, and the pulmonary vein rims. And if they're adequate, you can take the patient to cath lab, have it closed in the cath lab. For some reason, if the rims are not adequate, or if you have a superior inferior sinus venosus defect, um, those can, uh, cannot be closed in a cath lab and you'll need to have surgical closure. This so again just shows uh, the placement of an amplatzer device in one of the large defects. Coming to the next uh, defect uh, is the ventricular septal defect. The ventricular septal defects are the most commonest of the congenital heart disease. Um, they form 25% of the cases and they're usually associated with multiple other uh, congenital heart diseases, um, many of them being the conotruncal malformations or um, lesions like the double outlet right ventricle, truncus arteriosus, tetralogy of fallow, and sometimes interrupted aortic arch complete AV canal defects and coarctation. And usually the VST shunt, as I mentioned, uh, is usually a left to right shunt. And um, the timing of the symptoms usually depends upon the location of the VST, the size of the VST. Large VSTs in uh, younger patients can cause uh, form, uh, pulmonary edema, tachypnea, and failure to thrive. Older patients who have large unoperated defects, a large unoperated VSTs, eventually leads to pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary vascular disease. And once your pulmonary pressures increase and rise the pressures increase, you can have a shunt reversal from left to right to going from right to left, causing cyanosis, which is also called as the Eisenmenger's complex or Eisenmenger's syndrome. So VSTs uh, can, be very well defined in one particular location, but we have also seen many of the defects overlap. You could have a perimembranous VSD overlapping with partly muscular uh, VSD. You can have uh, inlet VSDs that extend to into the perimembranous region. You can have a supracrystal VSD. So just to kind of briefly describe the perimembranous VSD, these are the ones that are very closely related to the uh, right and non-coronary cusp uh, of the aortic valve. And they're also very closely related to the tricuspid valve and the valve tissue. And this in some patients can help in uh, spontaneous closure of the VSD or a period of time. The muscular VSDs are usually in the intraventricular septum, the muscular part. Uh, they form 20% of these defects and can undergo spontaneous closure in as much as 60% of the cases. 
Inlet BSDs, I'll come to this more in detail when I describe the AV canal. They form 5% of the difference, and they are usually at the inlet level, or uh, to describe it better, where your uh, tricuspid and the mitral valves open. So the septum in that particular location, uh, when you have a VSD, are called as the inlet VSDs. Supracrystal are uh, also not very common. The supracrystal VSDs are usually more superior and anterior and very closely related to the pulmonary valve. Here again, it's kind of a parastone short axis view to just to give you an orientation. Uh, this is where you normally see your perimembranous VSD and your muscular VSD is usually in the interventricular septum more into the muscle part. The classic view for a defining a perimembranous VSD in, is in this short axis. If you look at the short axis, and if you, if you look at this diagram here, and you divide this diagram between 9 and 11 o'clock position, and if you have a shunt between the 9 and 11, is where your perimembranous VSD usually sits. And in this case, you can see the perimembranous VSD with the shunting from left to right. Uh, this is your aortic valve here. This is your uh, right ventricle. And at the same time, uh, if you have a defect that extends from 11 to 2 o'clock, that would be a supracrystal VSD. One of the things that you can also obtain when you have a VSD that's shunting is to get a Doppler, uh, spectral Doppler across it, get your gradient. The gradient can, of you see a pressure difference between your RV and your R, uh, sorry, LV and your RV which in indirectly usually reflects your pulmonary artery pressures. Here, um, again, in an apical four chamber view, you see the small muscular VS in the interventricular septum. So this is uh, a patient who had complete AV canal defect. And the reason I wanted to show this image is to kind of give you an idea of where the inlet VSD sits. You have got the right AV valve or the tricuspid valve here, the left AV valve or the mitral valve, a large primum atrial septal defect, and here is the inlet VSD associated with this sort of uh, defects. Clinical features, uh, like I mentioned, usually depends upon the size of the ventricular septal defect. Uh, if they're small, they can be asymptomatic. Uh, larger defects can delay growth in, in and babies and smaller patients can later on lead to exercise intolerance. With the increased pulmonary vascularity can lead to recurrent pulmonary infections and then leading later on to congestive heart failure. Long-standing uh, large VSDs can lead to pulmonary hypertension and cyanosis because of the right to left shunt. Supracrystal VSD is unique because many of the supracrystal VSDs are usually small and with a high velocity. The high velocity jet creates something, um, what you must have heard is a venturi effect, uh, causing uh, a suction on the anterior leaf level of the aortic valve, which initially collapses a little bit, eventually leading to some amount of aortic insufficiency. And over a period of time, this can be progressive. And if uncorrected in time, can lead to significant aortic insufficiency and later on aortic valve replacement. Couple of confounding factors that I wanted to bring up uh, in looking at the VSDs and trying to assess the um, gradients across the tricuspid valves is that a VSD, a large VSD, can re reflect your left ventricular pressures. And so the tricuspid wheels and jet sometimes can inaccurately give you a much higher pressures. And so those, those pressures actually don't reflect your pulmonary pressures. Those are the pressures from your left ventricle. And you should be careful that. Um, those may not be your real pulmonary pressures. In babies who are newborn, we have seen that they have pretty large defects, but when they're born, the right side of pressures are still very high. And many a times we can underestimate the size of the VSD because there's not much of shunting, happen shunting happening from left to right because both the chambers, usually the pressures are pretty close. And uh, it can be a confounding factor again where you might underestimate the shunt and size of your VSD because of their elevated right side pressures. Management of VSDs, uh, essentially, uh, initially start off with diuretics. Uh, if your shunt is greater than uh, 1.5, you're going for a surgical closure. If there is prolapse, like I mentioned, aortic valve prolapse in a 
supracrystal VSD or progressive aortic insufficiency is an indication for surgery. Some patients who have um, VSDs uh, can have hypertrophy of some of the musculature in the right ventricular outflow tract, creating what is called as a double chambered right ventricle. And this again is an indication for uh, surgery. Some well-placed muscular VSDs go to the cath lab and they can be closed using a device, but it's uh, not so commonly done because most of the VSDs are either close to the perimembranous region, which are hard to close with a device. Um, this is an interesting case of a patient who was 30 years old, had large VSD, and never had surgical repair, uh, eventually leading to pulmonary hypertension. And you can see with elevated right sided pressures, you have septal flatten over here. And when this patient came to the clinic, um, this is their photo which was done quite recently. Uh, you can see that there is a large VSD and the shunt is bidirectional. This is not the ideal angle to look at the shunt, but in this particular patient, the shunt was bidirectional and uh, the saturations when he was in the clinic was around 75%. So uh, like we mentioned earlier, patients who have large VSDs uncorrected over a period of time develop for my hypertension and asymptomatous complex. Coming to the next uh, defect is the patent ductus arteriosus. Uh, it's more commonly seen in the younger population, uh, rarely seen in an adult population. So this forms approximately five to 10% of the congenital heart defects. And just to briefly touch on the uh, embryology, when um, a baby is born, there is this particular a vessel that connects the, this is the main pulmonary artery, right and left pulmonary arteries, and the aortic arch. And you've got the sixth left parenchial arch, which connects the pulmonary artery to the aortic arch, which forms the PDA. Most of them close within the first few days of life, but occasionally they tend to be patent, especially if the baby is premature. Clinically, these patients can have uh, a continuous heart murmur bounding pulses because of the runoff across the PDA from the aorta, a wide pulse pressure. Small PDAs usually are asymptomatic. Large PDAs like the VSDs can cause left heart dilation. That's a left atrium, left ventricular dilation and congestive heart failure. One of the other complications later on with a smaller PDA is uh, end arthritis, where if you have a small PDA that has got a high velocity jet that hits the Pulmonary arterial wall can cause seeding of bacteria and cause an infection there. On the uh, images on the right, uh, what you see here, this is the RPA, this is the main pulmonary artery, and you can see the iota here and the PDA, which is shunting in this case, all left to right. With the PDA, again, you can get a spectral Doppler. It gives you a pressure gradient. In this case, the pressure gradient is 82, which is the pressure difference between the iota and the pulmonary artery. And that can, if you know this, your systolic blood pressure can give you the estimate of your pulmonary pressures based on the difference between your PDA gradient and your systolic blood pressure. This is a, a three, three cine images that I wanted to show you just to get you an idea of uh, the different shunts that you can have in a PDA based on the pulmonary pressures. In this particular patient, you can see the shunt is all going uh, the red is all going left to right. Here uh, you can see flash of both red and blue, which is a bi-directional shunt across the PD. And the last one is mostly all right to left, it's mostly blue. So I just wanted to give you an idea of the different directionality of flow across the PD based on the pulmonary pressures. Again, management uh, in smaller patients uh, are of premature babies, you can try medical management. Usually they try indomethacin, ibuprofen, and recently even um, Tylenol or Ascendopin has been tried with success. Surgical closure of the, or surgical ligation of the PDA was commonly done, uh, even at our institution a year ago, but these days uh, the intervention team has taken over and has been coiling most of the PDAs in the premature babies and if I remember right, they, the smallest baby they coiled was approximately 800 grams. And that's one of the common procedures that they have been doing these days. This is an older patient, uh, two-year-old who had a 
TDA and just wanted to show you, uh, in this case, it was an amp acid device that was placed to occlude the TDA. Coming to AV septal defects or AV canam defects. So this forms approximately 5% of the congenital heart defects. And they're very commonly associated with trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. One of the common findings in AV septal defects, besides having the primal atrial septal defect, inlet PSD is a cleft in the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. Uh, since it's a common AV valve, most of the AV valve, both the AV valves are usually at the same level, and you don't see the epical displacement of the tricuspid valve. This again diagram diagrammatically represents, uh, in this case, it's a normal a like tricuspid and mitral valve. Here you have got a what is called a partial AV canal. You don't have a VSD component, you have the atrial septal defect, and this is a complete AV canal where you've got common AV valve, you've got a primum ESD and an inlet PSD. This diagram here represents how a com common AV valve looks. You've got two superior and inferior bridging leaflets. You've got a right mural and left mural, and then a right anterior superior leaflet. This again, to show you that the AV valves are at the same level in a common AV canal defect. So this in this particular patient, um, this patient had just had the primum atrial septal defect and no VSD. And what you see here is the shunt across the primum septum. Here is a on pause view of the mitral valve or the left AV valve. And what I wanted to show you in this image is as I scroll through this, so as I come over here, There's a cleft in the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And this is very common in AV canal defects. Uh, and this accounts for sometimes very significant regurgitation across that valve. So here you can see in the short axis view, again, the regurgitation through the same defect, which is much better appreciated when you look into the apical force chamber view. You have got some amount of right AV valve regurgitation, but the majority of your regurgitation is coming off from that cleft in that anterior leaflet. This is again um, an image of a partial AV septal defect where you see that there is no defect in your intraventricular septum, but you have a large primum defect. So the clinical features again is uh, based on the size of your ventricular septal defect and how much of AV valve regurgitation you have. Uh, if the AV valve regurgitation is not too bad, you can uh, delay the surgery, but if it's bad, uh, like in this particular patient, the surgery needs to be done around three or four months of age. Most of the adults that we see with AV canal defects are usually repaired in their childhood, and we normally see the complications of uh, the late complications post repair. Occasionally, you might have a primum atrial septal defect that was missed in the adult population and have a repair later on. I just wanted to bring uh, some images to show you the late, uh, late complications of an AV canal defect. One of them, as you saw earlier, was the AV valve regurgitation. Uh, post surgery uh, in childhood, approximately 15% of these patients have AV valve regurgitation which worsens over time and eventually needs a, another surgery and where the left AV valve or mitral valve either needs to be repaired or in most cases be replaced. The anatomy uh, in a common AV canal defect is uh, slightly different from our normal anatomy. So here you can see um, the pulmonary artery or pulmonary valve here, the aortic valve, and this is a normal anatomy. You've got the tricuspid and the mitral. In an AV canal, since you have a single common AV valve, the, an the aortic outflow is kind of pushed more anteriorly. So in one way, elongating your out aortic outflow, and you can see here, this is your left ventricle, your LVOT, which is pretty elongated because of that anterior deviation of your outflow. And uh, this can eventually lead to obstruction, narrowing, stenosis, 
And this on initially on the angiogram was sort of referred to as a ghost neck deformity. And just so that um, you can have an idea of why it was mentioning a ghost neck deformity. Late complications also include arrhythmias. And management uh, for younger patients with AV canal defects initially is medical management to counter the congestive heart failure. And we try to get the patients to surgery before pulmonary hypertension sets in. Most of the time we get babies with AV canal defect prepared around four to six months. But if they have Down syndrome, the chance of pulmonary hypertension happening is much earlier. So we tend to prepare them around three to four months of age. There are many different uh, varieties of ways that they can prepare single patch and two patch techniques. And like I mentioned, the complications include aerosidial VSD, AV valve regurgitation, um, LVOT, uh, narrowing of stenosis, and pulmonary hypertension. Coming to the last of the uh, congenital heart defects uh, that I'm going to cover today would be co optation of iota. So co-optation, as uh, all of you are aware, is basically a discrete narrowing of the aortic outflow. It could be a, a discrete region. It could be a long segment. And usually it happens in the proximal descending aorta. It's more common in males with a 1.5 male to female ratio. Um, it can be multifactorial. So genetic as well as en environmental factors can cause you to have co-optation of aorta. In infants, they can present with poor feeding, sometimes even uh, in cardiogenic shock. Um, and the pulses can be thready when you see them in either in the emergency uh, room or in the, in the ICU. Uh, if they don't go into uh, such overt congestive heart failure, sorry, um, in circulatory failure and shock, they can gradually develop congestive heart failure in some patients as uh, late as three months of age. Uh, one of the common findings in many of these patients is upper extremity hypertension. So here is uh, an echo image uh, to show you uh, the aortic arch. And most of the time, the co-optation is around this region. That's where the PDA connects. In this case, you can actually see there's a small PDA there. And that's where the narrowing and the acceleration happens. This is a suprasternal notch view of a spectral doctor, which again shows increased velocity. And this sort of a this is the diastolic continuation of flow because of the narrowed arch. So this pattern is commonly seen with co-optation. One of the other Dopplers that usually obtain is the abdominal aortic Doppler, especially in adults. And uh, on the left here, you see what's a normal Doppler pattern looks like. You could have flow somewhere around 80 to 120 centimeters per second. And with the co-optation, that Doppler signal is blunted and you can have much lower velocity dopplers because of the decreased flow coming to that abdominal aorta. One of the things to remember here is in older patients, your gradient when you look at the proximal descending aorta may not be too high just because they've already had multiple collaterals. So a lower gradient doesn't necessarily mean that you have, you don't have a severe co-optation. You have to take the whole picture into view and sometimes even resort to advanced cardiac imaging, CT, MRI, to get a better idea of the collateral flow. So this is an older patient, again, like uh, very severe co-optation. Uh, and you can see the large number of collaterals that are formed. This kind of a gross anatomy, just to show you how the arch looks in that particular region. This is the area where the narrowing and the co-optation is present. So there are many other associated um, cardiac lesions associated with co-optation, VSD, like we mentioned before, bicuspid aortic valve is very common, up to 42%. You can have aortic stenosis, subaortic stenosis, uh, parachute mitral valve, uh, PDA associated with co-optation. So again, just to show you the co-optation with a lot of collateral vessels coming out from um, the internal memory from the vertebral arteries. Many of the patients, uh, if it's mild co-optation, may be asymptomatic and later on presenting with hypertension. Severe co-optation uh, can present with congestive heart failure and shock, and also further clinical presentation depends on other associated lesions. Treatment for these patients is taken um, usually um, 
in the older patients when the diagnosis is made. And the different modalities that we use is uh, one is an N2 end anastomosis where the region of cooperation is restricted off and then you do an end to end anastomosis. In earlier days, they used to do a left subclavian flat aortoplasty. Uh, essentially, the left subclavian was sacrificed, used as a patch, and the area of cooperation was repaired. It's not done so frequently anymore. And you can also use, um, if it's mild co-optation and the patient is older, you can take them to the cat lab, initially try balloon and maybe stent that area and avoid a, a surgery. The complications post uh, repair or um, intervention in a co-optation can be a residual gradient or obstruction. Uh, sometimes you see a 20 millimeter gradient, which is usually not so much of a concern. Uh, you can have aneurysmal uh, dilation of that particular area, especially when you have used a subclavian flap. You've seen some patients come with aneurysmal dilation of that particular region, uh, rarely aortic dissection. Hypertension, many of these patients, because of the some residual co-optation, tend to be hypertensive and on antihypertensive for quite a long time, and rarely you can have endocarditis. With that, um, I conclude all the different cases in simple congenital heart disease and I'm open to questions. Uh, thanks for a great talk, Dr. Bajay. Uh, we have one question in the chat box that I could see. Uh, the question is, how do we differentiate ASD from a PFO on echo? So yeah, that's a good question. And that's some, something that we uh, almost every day face in our uh, pediatric echocardiography lab. So one of the, uh, in an ASD, your defect is very well defined and there is a good shunt. In a PFO, usually what you see is there is a flap across the defect. So you've got these two, your atrial septum is formed by a primum and a secundum septum. So usually with a PFO, you see a flap around the, if you look carefully, you might be able to see a flap in the region. And whenever you see a flap, uh, we kind of tend to call it as a patent foramen ovale. You don't see a flap, you see a very well-defined, uh, especially in 2D imaging, you see a well-defined defect. Uh, we kind of tend to call it as a atrial septal defect. Thank you. And the second question we have is, what determines the type of repair for coarctation, stent versus surgery, etc.? So um, there are a few studies that I've looked into, especially in the inner population. Um, so in the younger population, neonatal population, usually since the patient is uh, at a rapid rate of growth, uh, we resort to going for the surgical repair of the coarctation. In older patients, um, we tend to take them to the cath lab. Even if it's severe coarctation, our intervention team feels that they can balloon that area and, lay, and place a stent in that region and avoid a surgery. Um, most of the time when you have an interventional um, uh, like a solution to your co-optation, they tend to come back for a repeat uh, intervention on that particular region because of re-co-optation. Surgery is also is not always uh, free of intervention later on. We have occasionally patients who have had surgery come with residual uh, re-co-optation that needs to be uh, readdressed. And many times when the residual co-optation comes back in older patients, we tend to take them to the cath lab, but most of the neonates uh, whenever we have a co-optation, goes to the operating room to get it repaired. Thank you. I don't see any more questions in the chat box. Thank you once again. Sure, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for the excellent talk. Dr. Just a question about PFO, because I think we see this quite a bit in the adult world. Uh -huh. um, at what age do you usually expect PFOs to close? And what uh, what percentage do you see persistent PFOs in the pediatric population? So um, there is uh, no clear cut uh, timing. Many of them close, many of them don't. We see approximately 25% of our population with persistent PFOs. And we do tell the families that in uh, 25% of cases, this may be patent throughout their life. And as long as it is small without significant shunt, it's not of a big concern. Perfect. Thank you very much, Bijay. That was sure, an excellent you. review. Really appreciate your contribution to the lectures. Sure, thank you so much. Um, I don't see the next speaker um, there yet, Jay, unless I'm missing.
I think he said he's 20 and yeah i don't see him here i'll i'll get i think also finish a little early that might also be an issue I'll get <laughs> yeah that's all right neeraj are you able to uh go ahead and present if needed like we can give the next speaker a couple of minutes but uh i am okay let, let me, me let me just let me get everything ready though okay yeah i'll give you a couple of minutes just checking uh with the other speaker He said he's signing in, so I'll go ahead and introduce the next speaker while we wait for him to log in. Unfortunately, he's on call today, so I think he's kind of busy there. Next speaker is Dr. Ravi Ashwat. He's a clinical professor of pediatrics at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. He's the program director of the Pediatric Cardiology Fellowship Program, medical director of the non-invasive cardiac and pediatric uh, cardiac MRI, as well as the medical director of the pediatric specialty clinics at the University of Iowa. He did his... Uh, Residency in Pediatrics at Maria Ferreri Children's Hospital in New York Medical College in Valhalla, and went on to specialize in pediatric cardiology at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital in Cleveland, Ohio. He did advanced imaging and cardiac MRI at Boston Children's Hospital at Harvard University, and his research, include, research interests include applications of novel research sequences in cardiac MRI. He's actively involved in 3D printing of medical models for clinical use and education of trainees and patients, and is in the process of establishing a 3D printing center for the hospital. He has developed a program using virtual reality to educate medical uh, trainees. Uh, I see uh, that he's on the line. So Good morning, guys. I'm to... on. Uh... Let him take I over. I can share he's the also... screen. Yes, go ahead, Ravi. Okay, I cannot hear. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. We can hear you, Ravi. You can go ahead. Okay, perfect. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, if there is anything, I think, uh, you know, somebody can intimate me if there is any problems going on. So I'm one of the pediatric cardiologists at a children's hospital in uh, Iowa. The topic uh, that was given was complex uh, congenital heart disease, um, mostly geared towards uh, adults. And the second is geared a little bit towards uh, echo boards kind of uh, thing. So uh, <clears throat> the learning objectives we can uh, try to uh, get through is what are the types of synotic congenital heart disease and their pathophysiology a little bit. And this can come in various flavors when you guys see. It could be completely corrected. It could be just palliated. That means uh, some kind of uh, intermediate without full correction. And uh, some you might see neither have palliation nor have any kind of repair and it is just native congenital heart disease. Some of the treatments and surgical options and uh, names of the uh, surgeries that you might encounter, that might be good for uh, having a little idea and also for the boards. Some of the echo findings that uh, people might want to recognize and then give the diagnosis uh, with one or two pictures that are shown in the boards. Some of the post-operative checklists for these patients, what would be done when they see you guys in the clinics or uh, as a part of the echocardiograms and uh, touching up on long-term follow-up issues. Um, synotic congenital heart diseases, you know, the main uh, thing is we uh, teach folks by uh, remembering the mnemonic on the five T's. And the other way to remember it as we go along here is going to be thinking these things on the hand. 
So uh, for the first finger, since it's only one artery that is coming out in the truncus arteriosus, then we will put it on our uh, thumb. Transposition of the great arteries is of course associated with the aorta and pulmonary artery that are switched. So that is why it is two arteries that are involved. So we'll put it on the second finger and the tricuspid atresia, tri, third finger, tetralogy of fallow, tetra, four, so that will be on the fourth finger and total anomalous pulmonary venous written. For the sake of simplicity, we made it into five alphabets, T-A-P-V-R. And then here uh, it makes it as T-A-P-V-R, which is five. That will give us the um, fifth finger. So those were the five T's, which are, I think, a little bit easier and probably need to remember. Uh, and uh, the big palm of the hand right now Takes, takes care of the hypoplastic right, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and some other complex uh, heart diseases that could be Epstein's CCTGA and the Chris Carr's heart, isomerism, heterotaxy, and all those things. So this will be a good way to remember this uh, synotic congenital heart disease. Next is the relative frequency of synotic congenital heart disease in terms of complex. You know, you can go through this list here, but the, the most important thing to remember at this point is the commonest cyanotic congenital heart disease is going to be tetralogy of fallow. It's asked in the boards uh, several times. The trickier question asked here is what is the commonest congenital heart disease? Then it would be VSD. The other uh, variation of this question is what is the commonest uh, you know, heart disease that people are born with is actually bicuspid aortic valve. So when you look at the question, it has to be a little careful about, you know, what is the commonest heart disease and bicuspid aortic valve is in the, uh, one of the answers, I would pick that. If it is just a complex heart disease, complex and synotic, it's tetralogy. If it is just a congenital heart disease, it's VST. So those are, I think, a little bit of the trickier stuff that they can move it around a little bit. But the synotic congenital heart disease, they're expecting you to know that tetralogy is common. Next is uh, in the stem of the questions, things can come up with, uh, this is a patient who had this syndrome and they're explaining to you about what the findings in the echo or MR or CT is. So if one has a little sense of uh, this little slide, I think it helps people to get out the diagnosis quicker, out of which uh, DeGeorge, otherwise 22Q11 deletion associated with conotruncal lesions. That means tetralogy of fellow truncus arteriosus. Down syndrome is a favorite one uh, that they ask of VSD and AV canal, just like the previous uh, trick question I said. So VSD is still the commonest heart lesion in Down syndrome, however, AV canal happens most commonly in patients with Down syndrome. So one needs to know a little bit of that uh, twisting of the questions there. Morphon syndrome, <clears throat> I don't need to tell the adult population, you guys are looking for mitral via prolapse. You're looking at um, aortic dilation and dissections. Lewis Dietz syndrome on the same tone is an extended form of morphons, which is severe form in terms of the uh, genetics and the uh, collagen and everything. So they are at risk of dissection sooner in terms of the size of the aorta, uh, not as a bicuspid aortic valve or morphon syndrome. Noonan syndrome, pulmonary stenosis. Later, they can develop hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Some instances of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are noted even in uh, children. Turner syndrome, they like to ask this. They can show you a bicuspid aortic valve or a picture of coarctation and the associated syndrome, or they can tell you what the syndrome is and show you a picture of the echo, and then you're looking at either bicuspid or coarctation. Partial anomalous pulmonary venous return can occur in Turner syndrome, but uh, that might not be a question they would ask you. It's a little complicated. Williams syndrome, supravalvar aortic stenosis, and can also have peripheral pulmonic stenosis. Holt Orem syndrome, I saw in one of the board reviews for you guys that they had asked, the cardiac lesion is ASD, but they will always give you an associated thing about they will have radial bone abnormalities. Trisomy 13 and 18, uh, just uh, to complete this, uh, very rarely that you will see a 13 and 18 patients get into the adult um, age group. 
Next uh, is surgeries in congenital heart disease. Uh, you know, what are the surgery names that you will see? What, uh, what do they actually mean, at least in uh, principle? So a Blalock toxic shunt, the common BT shunt, is a shunt that is put from uh, systemic to pulmonary circulation from an iota to the pulmonary artery, most commonly done in uh, tetralogy of fallow in various uh, forms of tetralogy. You know, it could be just severe pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary atresia. Basically, you're taking blood from the aortic circulation and putting it into the pulmonary circulation because there is some problem with the blood getting out from the right ventricle into the pulmonary circulation, secondary to obstruction. Part shunt. <clears throat> these are questions that they like to ask, even though we don't do many of these anymore. Uh, descending aorta to LPA shunt. The one thing to know about part shunt at this time is it has taken a resurgence back again because of treating people with severe pulmonary hypertension that uh, they're putting these shunts so they can relieve the RV pressures by taking blood from the uh, pulmonary artery and putting it into the descending aorta. Uh, so that's a thing that might be asked. Waterston shunt used to be done before, but that's ascending aorta to the RPA. And you would not want to do that in uh, pulmonary hypertension patients because you would be supplying uh, cyanotic blood to the um, head if that's the case. And then uh, we will uh, hear these operations, Norwood operation. It is basically the first stage of a single ventricle operation. And that uh, goes along with either a sono shunt, which is basically a right ventricle to pulmonary artery conduit, and or they could have a BT shunt. I will go through this uh, when looking and showing pictures in the end. Bidirectional glen shunt is the second stage of the single ventricle palliation, where the superior vena cava gets an astomose to the right pulmonary artery. And then the completion would be the fontan operation, which is IVC hooking up to the pulmonary artery. And that will be the third and the final stage. So whenever people say this patient has had fontan completion, that means that they have gone through the first and the second stage. So it is it is not like patients can have the third stage without the second and the first. Some, some of the times, based on the lesions, one could go directly to bidirectional glen and then to fontan, skipping the Norwood operation in a certain lesions that uh, is not uh, in the purview of this uh, review. Rashkind operation or procedure is basically a balloon atrial septostomy done in a transposition to help mixing of the blood so the patient survive in the first initial uh, weeks. Jetine operation commonly seen uh, in all the patients who would have detransposition of the great arteries. And when you do the jetine operation, one has to be aware that it uh, comes with Lecomte maneuver where it's a special maneuver of getting the pulmonary arteries in such a position that it actually wraps around the aorta and it does not sit like the usual pulmonary artery aorta relationship in the normal heart. So that should be known for reasons that we will go over. Mustard and sinning operation is atrial switch operation as opposed to the arterial switch operation just that we just went. So here, this is done for DTGA also, but this was an older operation that was done and uh, it has fallen out of favor for DTGA. Mm -hmm. However, if patients have congenitally corrected transposition, then uh, the patients might need a double switch operation. In that case, you will see both atrial and arterial switch operation, and hence mustard and sending. Still, probably we cannot forget the operation. A Restelli procedure, when you hear, is uh, basically routing the blood from uh, left ventricle through a VST into the niota, which is situated a little bit different. And that way you get the blood out from LV through the VST into the iota without switching anything. And then you put a conduit from RV to the PA because there's probably PS or uh, something of that sort where you still have to do that. So that's Restelli procedure. Warden operation, pulmonary PAPVR or partial anomalous pulmonary venous return is something that you guys will see a little bit more commoner, not because of the uh, new incidents or anything, it's just because the advanced imaging of CT and MR is able to pick up these lesions with uh, mildly symptomatic patients and they might need this operation called the Warden operation.
Brock Corporation was pulmonary valve automate done surgically, not uh, not much anymore because we can do pulmonary valve, you know, valvuloplasty, balloon valvuloplasty by cath these days. So after that introduction of, uh, you know, what kind of complex heart diseases and what kind of surgeries, we can go a little bit into the tetralogy of follow, which is the commonest one. Uh, Dijard syndrome, I told you, and uh, there is one third association with the right aortic arch and the aortic arch sidedness is based on which side of the trachea the arch turns and comes down. So if the arch turns to the right of the trachea and then swings on the right bronchus and comes down, that's the right aortic arch in the normal, it is to the left of the trachea, the ascending aorta turning back and it's on the left bronchus and that's what makes it a left aortic arch. It's not about whether it's the right or left of the spine kind of a thing. Of course, tetralogy of uh, fellow, depending on the severity of pulmonary stenosis, it can range from uh, pink tet, similar to a VSD physiology, all the way to the extreme of that spectrum of pulmonary atresia. That means there is no pulmonary valve. One needs to also know they can show a coronary artery anomaly and out of which the commonest one has to remember is a left anterior descending coronary artery coming off of the right coronary artery. And it is important because you're dealing with doing some kind of operation on the right ventricular outflow tract, and you don't want a coronary artery crossing on the RVOT, and then you slice the coronary artery and they're gonna be in trouble. Chest X-ray sometimes is shown and asking what kind of lesion is it? And they're expecting a boot-shaped heart to be shown in the chest X-ray. Um, Egg on a string would be transposition of the great arteries and a snowman appearance in the chest X-ray would be TAPVR of the supracardiac type. Just to those three chest X-rays might be asked. Four things in the uh, tetralogy of follow as we uh, overriding of the aorta, then the pulmonary stenosis, right ventricular hypertrophy, and then of course the ventricular septal defect. So I will show you in the echocardiogram what that means. Between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, the muscle tissue is called the conus, and the conus should come down and this septum should meet each other, but this is deviated this way into the right ventricular outflow tract, and hence there's less blood supply and the whole lesion is because of the anterior superior deviation of the conal septum is the unifying uh, reason for tetralogy follow. Very rare to establish a diagnosis in uh, adulthood as a primary uh, diagnosis. We probably would have sent them repaired within the first year of life. And uh, so mostly encountered our post-operative patients. We could have palliative blalock toxic shent and that's it. And that's rare, but you could see some patients that way. But complete repair is the rule. Now, since this is echo and uh, people wanna see how to diagnose lesions when they show by echocardiogram. So I'll spend a few minutes here orienting and actually explaining a few things because I saw the board review courses and I think uh, we have a good understanding of what they're expecting of you. First is if they show a peristal long axis here and clearly this is no different from an adult view. So that's the mitral valve, LA, LV and IOTA. So what you clearly see right here and they will make it very clear that this uh, artery is overriding the septum here, and then there is the VST here. So once you see an overriding septum of the iota, overriding iota, we call it on the septum, and in VSD, you know, 95% of the time, you know, if this is the only picture they show, then this is tetralogy of follow for all practical purposes. Okay, so that's the most important here. If some people in the uh, audience want to say, you know, what's the difference between tetralogy and double outlet right ventricle, I want to know. You can look at the uh, mitral annulus here and then the aortic annulus. That's called as the mitral to aortic continuity. In normal patients and or normal subjects, the aortic valve and the mitral valve share that one uh, fibrous ring in continuity. And the tetralogy follow patients that is maintained. So if you see there is continuity between the mitral valve here and the aortic valve at this juncture, and uh, people are like, oh, it's still overriding. It could be double outlet right ventricle. Yes, it could be if there is discontinuity. So that is the only diagnostic thing in echocardiogram 
if people are trying to trick you with the double outlet right ventricle versus tetralogy of fallow, there will be a big amount of separation here between the aortic and the mitral annulus. Very rarely asked, but uh, that's one thing to know if this is the picture people are paying attention to. So that's uh, tetralogy of fallow. I will come on, on this little bit of nuances of, yes, there is one artery overriding, you know, what would be the differential diagnosis here? So that's the next uh, questions they will ask. So the differential diagnosis, however, is from the right ventricle, one has to show a second artery coming out or a second artery that cannot be seen coming out of the right ventricle, right? So that's the second picture one has to show. If, if they show that sweep and nothing comes out of the right ventricle, then it could still be tetralogy of follow with pulmonary atresia. And if they show nothing comes out of the RV, however, they show some arteries coming out of this big artery that's coming out here, it could be truncus. So let us summarize this. The commonest picture they will show you is this with an overriding aorta and a VSD. And if you put tetralogy follow, you will be correct almost all the time. But if they want to dig further in, they will have to show you an artery coming out of here expecting you to write truncus for that uh, question, or they have to show a sweep or a second picture showing that actually an artery is coming out of this also, and that is a pulmonary artery, and that would be tetralogy of follow. And if they show nothing coming out of here, but there is actually an artery here stopping pulmonary arteries here. So I think if you know that concept, I think half of the echo questions are based on this uh, one particular picture. So then, of course, they will they can show you the color in the VSDs. These are all newborn echoes, and I think in the board review I saw that's what they were talking about. So it's bidirectional because, of course, the pressure in the right ventricle is higher. They will also demonstrate right ventricular hypertrophy sometimes here. So that will be the most important two pictures. Now, when I said sweep, we can do sweeping both ways. You're not used to sweeping, you know, going down towards the tricuspid valve in this picture and coming up. And I will show in the next picture when we go anteriorly that we will see that. So this is a sweep. Now, the other concept here is they're gonna show you a short axis view like so, tricuspid valve here, right ventricle, right atrium. And here, when you see the iota here, you see, a gap here. So whenever you see a gap here, a few things, uh, maybe Dr. Bijoy uh, went over this in the last lecture, uh, just to uh, recap, is if you see a hole here, and if you see this is a clock face here, and if you see that the VST occurs somewhere between nine o'clock and 11 o'clock only, then that will be a perimembranous type of VST. If it occurs here, this way, it can be a supracrystal VST or a malalignment type VST. Tetralogy of follow VSTs are called malalignment type. Before I had referred about a conal septum. So this is the conal septum here. So the conal septum should come around and complete the circle, but obviously that conal septum gets deviated this way, which is the right ventricular outflow tract here. So you see the deviation causing the pulmonary stenosis. So if you see a picture like that, with this showing that way, and clearly the aorta and the pulmonary artery, there's discrepancy. They're expecting you to look at uh, tetralogy of fellow. You can see that the valve is dysplastic here. Pulmonary artery is small and stenosis. So this is a malalignment type VST with the pulmonary stenosis. So this will be a short axis picture that one would show for a diagnosis of tetralogy of fellow. And uh, same thing with color. So the uh, flow acceleration or turbulence can start below the uh, valve because it's an infundibular type of obstruction and then goes along into the branch PAs. Um, a patent ductus arteriosus can also be uh, seen coming in and out here, which would be into the uh, junction of the MP and LPA from the descending iota. Probably that was covered in the past uh, session. So I switched the image, uh, I wanna say, to make it correct for you guys, or it's backward for us. That's why this is all uh, backward looking, to make it a little bit convenient for your looks. 
So left ventricle, right ventricle, I will let it sweep. As we sweep, we will go from posterior, then the iota comes up, and then if you watch the right ventricle, then the pulmonary artery comes out from here. I will let it sweep one more time. You can uh, appreciate a VSD overriding aorta at this time coming out of the LV and sitting on the septum and the right ventricle that is leading into the pulmonary artery that is small here. So this is an apical sweep if uh, you may, that they might show you in different forms of uh, still forms to show that this is tetralogy of follow. So I think uh, the guiding principles is overriding of aorta and a VST with pulmonary stenosis. In any combination, if put in, you should be thinking of tetralogy follow. And uh, this is again going towards the, so you can appreciate the right ventricular hypertrophy is pretty good here. And then this one is the uh, overriding of the aorta. But uh, once we go there, we could not see any kind of, uh, so if you see here, you don't see any continuation here anymore. You see the malalignment VST here, and you see that there's a membranous atresia of the pulmonary valve. So that would be a pulmonary atresia at this point. So this would be a tetralogy of pulmonary atresia. Uh, I wouldn't expect them to show pulmonary atresia, but if you know, then you can probably differentiate uh, between truncus and things like that. So uh, then, uh, you know, sometimes uh, they will come back for uh, seeing you guys for uh, after the repair. So this is just to show a VST patch here, how the VST patch would look in terms of stuff, you know, in looking for residual VSTs, looking for residual pulmonary stenosis and things like that. And so here, some of the times the right ventricular outflow tract was smaller. So we would have put a stent in it. So this is just to show our VOT and stent. And as you, uh, keep seeing the images that I keep showing, it seems like it's pretty easy to diagnose tetralogy because the images that I'm showing back to back is about the same kind of a theme. And uh, since it's the most commonest lesion, I just put a lot of pictures so people have, you know, a pictorial uh, memory of what a short axis would look like, what a sweep if they show a sweep, and what a still picture for tetralogy follow would look like. And they also could have in a right ventricle to pulmonary artery conduit based on pulmonary atresia diagnosis. It could be a valved conduit or it could be a conduit without a valve. So then you might see them in various stages of conduit stenosis, conduit regurgitation, calcification and things like that. So if they show this and said a patient had an operation when he was little and had a conduit placed and this and that, and then there's a patch here for a VST, then you're thinking of it being um, tetralogy follow also. Short axis, remember there was a VST here and so they would have put a patch here and then you are seeing the color going from the left side to the right side somewhere along the patch. So that's a residual VST probably along the patch margin. So it's not a significant VST, but that's the views that one can show either a VST or a patch leak after tetralogy follow. So the repair that would have been done for all these patients could be a transannular patch in that the pulmonary valve is sacrificed in terms of, so there's gonna be a pulmonary regurgitation and right ventricular dilatation. Of course, they will do the VST closure. So in terms of uh, post-operative and when you guys see what are the questions to be answered, it's simple. Patient had a VST, so a patch was placed. So you're looking for an intact patch and no residual VSTs. If there is, you can figure out QPQS. Uh, pulmonary regurgitation is the most commonest uh, sequelae long-term that will lead to the right ventricular size being bigger. And uh, once people decide when to put the uh, pulmonary valve, the number at least quoted as of now for you guys to remember is if the RV and the diastolic volume is more than 150 ml per meter squared by uh, MRI, then they might be qualifying for the um, pulmonary valve placement, either a transcatheter or surgical based on uh, the nitty gritties of uh, the way the RVOT looks. Then you always look for branch pulmonary arteries and uh, calculate differential flows if needed. So you can intervene if one of the arteries is uh, hypoplastic. Uh, tetralogy of follow patients, as you know, have had surgeries and they could have uh, 
some amount of scarring and arrhythmias. So you will want to make sure you get a delayed enhancement. And then look for other things of coronary artery anatomy and things like that. Iota and ascending aorta are dilated, but uh, in tetralogy of follow patients, they are at uh, extremely, extremely, extremely low risk of uh, dissections. So you have the same measurements on a tetralogy versus morphone versus bicuspid aortic, where clearly tetralogy of follow patients, we don't do much about it. MRI can give you good pictures to show you the RV volumes and calculate. You can also see the patches and make sure that they're okay. So that's the tetralogy of follow. And we'll uh, step to the next uh, most commonest one that you guys will see in uh, real practice in boards, in either uh, regular boards or uh, echo boards. For this, I would take about just a few minutes here so people can get uh, a little comfortable once they know this slide and put this in their, uh, you know, like a pictorial memory in the brain. I think uh, it's very easy, I feel, once uh, you have this little concept. We will uh, start with uh, what kind of uh, transpositions we deal with. One is the classical, that is the DTGA. And the other one is, uh, we should really be calling it CCTGA, but uh, you know it's interchangeably called the LTGA, but uh, that's fine for now. So those are the two. So now let us uh, look at the picture on the right side and try to understand a little bit here. When you take a short axis of the, um, base of the heart, and you're looking for a pulmonary artery and aorta, you know, we all know that the aorta is posterior and right of the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery never moves in embryology or whatever you want to say. It is always the aorta that dances around the pulmonary artery and can go all around the pulmonary artery in a circle. So that's the first concept. The second concept is any time the uh, aorta makes it anterior to the pulmonary artery. It is called transposition. So that's the first thing to remember is when you put a short axis picture that anybody can get, and if you see that the aorta is residing anterior to the pulmonary artery, you call it transposition and you will never be wrong. And next is, you know your right, you know your left. And if you have the aorta sitting to the right of the pulmonary artery, remember it is still anterior, then you just call it detransposition. We know detransfer dextro, so we don't need to remember that. And if the iota sits on to the left of the pulmonary artery and it is still anterior, you call it L transposition. So I think if we know this and we go for the short axis and figure out where the iota and pulmonary artery are, then I think we, uh, we are pretty set with understanding the D and the uh, L transposition. The only time the iota sits uh, posterior and to the left of the pulmonary artery is a very, very, very rare uh, occasion, which is situs inversus totalis. I mean, for that, uh, you know, it's not the commonest that you guys see. And situs inversus totalis, the heart is mostly normal and probably people will not see you guys. So summary is iota anterior to the PA, you call it transposition. If it is to the right, you call it D. If it is to the left, you call it L. And, um, so now, echo pictures, what can they show you? And what are the things that are uh, typically that you need to know about these transpositions? That because you have uh, 30 seconds to look and say, make a diagnosis. A lot of times the stem of the question will have the answer, but a few things I will uh, show you is, whenever you see the two arteries side by side, normally when you see one artery in the longitudinal, the other artery will be cross-sectional. So what I mean to say is they're orthogonal, right? One is you're looking at this opened up, the other one will be on FOSS. That's usually how they are, the way the aorta and the pulmonary artery are related. But if they show you a picture where the two arteries are kind of side by side, opening the same kind of longitudinal, longitudinal, that's transposition for echo world, okay? So that's the first clue saying that this is a transposition. Second, is whenever they're showing, you know, you want to make sure the ventricular morphology, we all understand what ventricle is coming out of, uh, sorry, what ventricle gives rise to the arteries. So pay attention to the ventricular septal surface here, this one. And this side, I want to say it's pretty clean, smooth. This side, not so clean. There's a lot of attachments of some kind of valve, 
you know, papillary muscles, moderator band and such. So whenever you see a ventricle with a septum that is smooth like so, that's a left ventricle, morphologic left ventricle. And whenever you see attachments like this, it's a morphologic right ventricle. So that is one thing that quickly on a view, they will show a good picture showing that depiction for you to make sure it's an LV and an RV. I'm telling you this because we are gonna deal with CCTGA and that's where it comes in uh, handy, but now they're not gonna tell you the diagnosis. So you need to just quick take a look and say, okay, yes, I got it. This is smooth left ventricle, right ventricle. So you got that sorted out. And then once you see an LV posteriorly, that's what usually it is anyway, normally. So this is a normal ventricular relationship. So now when you see the artery coming out, the iota, you are always used to see the iota go this direction. Whenever you see an artery dipping posteriorly like so, and if they show branching, which is great, which probably here is the branching. Of course, if it branches sooner, this artery branches sooner and dips posteriorly, that cannot be the iota. So that's always a pulmonary artery. And this one, if you see here, starts here, and when it finishes, it has a big stuff without branching. So based on this, here, if they show a still picture, they have to show a still picture where this artery dips backwards. That is transposition of the detransposition type. And you also have side-by-side -side arteries, and you have figured out what ventricles they are. So you are good with uh, figuring out that the ventricular relationship is okay. It's the arterial relationship that's not good. And then here, of course, the pulmonary artery is posterior and iota is anterior. So we know it's transposition, you know, to figure out L and D, you know, we will go back uh, to the second uh, trick that we have. So I think that's uh, the main picture here. So here, some of these pictures are a little bit twisted. So I'm sure uh, somebody in the audience uh, will not agree with it being totally right of the uh, pulmonary artery here, but this is iota anterior and ever so slightly right. It will be actually a little bit more right, but the picture probably was, you know, somebody might have turned it a little bit, but the concept is iota anterior and to the right, it's gonna be detransposition of great arteries. How would you know this is iota? Of course, you have the whole arch that you follow. This follow the whole arch and make sure that's iota. Second thing is this structure will give rise to coronary arteries that we are used to seeing. So they might uh, show or point to the coronary arteries. So if not, anytime they show anterior, posterior and a little bit to the right, do not uh, hesitate. It is gonna be detransposition or the transposition of the great arteries of the common type that we always deal with. So between those two pictures, I think transposition will not be missed. And this is a subcostal sweep. I'm sorry we show sweeps here, but uh, unfortunately it's important for us to figure out where, what comes off. So I'm gonna read this loop run one more time and then I will explain. So that's left ventricle, VSD, aorta coming off of the right ventricle here. And you see this, I will just go back here and probably have to pause it. So here, when I show there, you see this artery branches into two there. So that is the pulmonary artery that branches into two. And you see the VSD? And you see the artery that comes off of the LV branches, and then the one that comes off of the RV goes straight up. So that's RV coming off, sorry, iota of RV. So this is a detransposition with a VST patient. Apical view, showing that this is LV, and this is an artery that branches right away into the right and the left pulmonary arteries, or it branches and hence the pulmonary artery coming off of the left ventricle and uh, detransposition of the great arteries. Pulmonary artery is uh, posterior. So the branching of the pulmonary artery will be obviously looking a little bit different here. And um, we will uh, go over the repairs and stuff a little bit, but this is one of the pictures. If uh, of course, transposition of the great arteries here, this is the D type of transposition where patient in the past used to have the Senning operation, which is the atrial baffling operation. So now looking at the ventricular septum, it doesn't take too long to figure out that this is a smoother one 
So this is the left ventricle, that's the right ventricle. So that's the first thing in congenital heart. You guys have to take a look if they're trying to get to any of the lesions between the ventricular problems and concordance, right? This one. So yes, it's LV, RV. People can also look at the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve offset to make sure you're dealing with what ventricles. That's going to be helpful in CCTGA. So of course, uh, this one gave rise to the aorta. Remember, it's transposition. This one gives rise to the pulmonary artery. Since we're not switching the arteries, the pulmonary venous baffle is going to be directed right into the RV. Red blood, red blood, red blood to the right ventricle, and then it leads to the aorta. And then the systemic venous baffle will come here, SVC, IVC, into this ventricle, LV, blue blood, goes to the pulmonary artery. So this is a baffle sending that you might see in older patients. This is showing that there is a baffle leak here. So that will be one of the things that when you see sending patients, you're looking for leaks or you're looking for baffle stenosis and things like that. So surgical repair of uh, detransposition of the great arteries, you know, atrial switch, that was the one that was done before. As I said, atrial switches where you build a baffle like a pair of pants. One leg of the pant goes there, one leg of the pant goes here and then the waste of the pant gets sutured around the mitral annulus. So the blue blood can go, the atrial septum is completely taken off and it comes here, that goes to the PA and the pulmonary venous baffle just flows around it. There's no special baffle made for it because you already made a baffle here. It flows around it and makes it here, goes to the aorta. So that is the um, classic sending or mustard that was done. You know, in, in terms of if they have a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, they can have a restally procedure. I would not go into the details of that, neither do you have to remember that. As long as you remember the older operation for DTGA was this, and this is how it looks, I think it's more than enough. And of course, now we all prefer, everybody gets an arterial switch operation because it's a clean operation and it is both anatomically and physiologically correct. And the previous operation was physiologically correct, but anatomically not because the right ventricle still works by pumping against the aorta. So here you take this, take this, switch it around, put the coronary buttons where they belong and do the Lecomte maneuver and you'll get. So post-operative uh, questions, of course, for atrial switch operation, as we know that they have baffles, we need to make sure that they have no baffle obstruction. Superior vena cava baffle obstruction is the most commonest board question. And um, baffle leaks uh, will need to be taken care if the QPQS is higher. So they will need a cath and they can get a cath intervention and the baffle leaks can be closed. So that's what you're looking in the echo. If there is leaks, then you have to calculate QPQS, either advanced imaging and get them for a closure. We all uh, remember that right ventricle is pumping into the aorta in an atrial switch operation. So that was not designed to do that for several years of life and hence causes dilation, dysfunction, leading to tricuspid regurgitation with annular dilatation. And of course, the septum gets bored completely into the left ventricular outflow tract because now right side is the systemic ventricle. So that could cause left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. When we say left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, that is the morphologic ventricle. So it leads blood to the pulmonary artery. And there's a lot of suture lines in uh, these baffles, so prone for a lot of atrial arrhythmias and some ventricular arrhythmias. DTGA, the more of which I think you will see is wherever they did the anastomosis at the pulmonary artery and the aorta site, you will see some stenosis. And I will show you pictures of a Lecompte and why we are always talking about branch pulmonary artery stenosis. And the coronary arteries are reimplanted usually at a later age. It's not that common, but you will look for that. If you're going to cat, they will look different. They don't come off where you're expecting them to come off. So you need to remember that part. And the aortic dilatation, because this is also a conotruncal abnormality. Any conotruncal lesions, aortic dilation is common but uh, not significant with the no untoward events. So to just uh, help understand how the sending operation and how a systemic venous baffle will look, this is a good picture showing the SVC and the IVC baffled all the way into the mitral valve, into the left ventricle. 
and this is posterior anterior the pulmonary veins baffled all the way back to the anterior right ventricle remember right ventricle left ventricle is smooth here so you can again see that so that's pulmonary venous baffle you can get a picture of this or this showing what are the issues you can now see that the systemic venous baffle with the svc that's going between the aorta and sometimes the right pulmonary artery here or the um, back of the atrium you see how this can get affected here and gets narrowed. And hence, that's the uh, baffle obstruction, that's SVC is the common type. When they do the operation, they cannot do the same kind of pulmonary artery putting it because pulmonary artery was behind. When they can get it to the front, they cannot do exactly how our pulmonary arteries will look. So they have to do this maneuver where this is anterior, the back of the screen is posterior. So the pulmonary arteries have to be put this way with the right and left pulmonary artery. And this is called the uh, Lecompte maneuver. When you see this, the stretching has to happen. So because of the stretching, there is gonna be a problem with the branch pulmonary artery stenosis. And if you see the coronary arteries coming off of the aorta, they will also be different. Both of them pretty much come anteriorly and not from the sinuses that we are used to. So those are things to keep in mind when you do CTs and things like that. In the echocardiogram, they will just show some turbulence going through the pulmonary arteries. And they might ask, you know, is it because of this maneuver? Or they can say, this is a patient with detransposition had the Lecompte maneuver and show you a picture with uh, what seems to be two pulmonary arteries and uh, a lot of flow turbulence. And maybe they will mark up a Vmax of 3.6 meters per second. Then you're thinking, okay, they're showing Lecompte. They're asking me to figure out branch pulmonary artery stenosis and hence the answer is they're showing branch pulmonary artery stenosis because it's very hard to image branch pulmonary arteries because they sit right behind the sternum and these are already adults with the one or two surgeries and a lot of scarring so this is very difficult to do echo wise so hence they will not probably show that a few words uh, in some of the things that we don't commonly see i think we are on time and uh, uh, we are okay. So CCTGA would be the right term uh, because LTGA only actually tells what the uh, arterial relationship is. It will not tell you what the ventricular relationship is and hence uh, to avoid the term. But uh, I don't think I'm here to change uh, the nomenclature today. It's uh, It's been so well entrenched that people continue to use that. So also known as physiologically corrected, as I said, this is a normal heart. Everybody can see that. The only difference here is right atrium will lead to left ventricle, and then that leads to the pulmonary artery, LA to RV to the aorta. So physiologically, nobody knows the difference. If people don't have a VSD, they do not have this stenosis, usually subpulmonic stenosis here. If they don't have a subpulmonic stenosis, VSD, associated Epstein's anomaly that they can have or heart block that they can have, then uh, you know we might not know these people until they're a third or fourth decade because the right ventricle can handle the systemic uh, pressures until that time and then it gives, you know, gives, gives off and then you have some difficulty breathing, shortness of breath and you go and look, the RV is struggling, there's a lot of regurgitation and then you figure it out that this was a CCTGA. So um, otherwise called as L a loop TGA. Associated lesions is because this is helpful for the stem of the question because by showing an echocardiogram picture and you are in a hurry and you don't have the time to figure out all the nuances of the ventricular septum and the anterior posterior relationship of the aorta, if you see these things, because this is very classical for congenitally corrected transposition association with Epstein's anomaly and WPW, complete heart block, and pulmonary stenosis VST, and also if they say dextrocardia. So these are the buzzwords in the question before the echocardiogram picture is posted that will guide you to the diagnosis of CCTGA. Okay, so echo pictures here. So as I said, you know, the pictures start getting worse as they grow older, but here from the previous things that we have noted, Remember the two arteries are side by side. So this must be some kind of a transposition. That's where you get at, right? So that's where you get at. And then you can see here, the next one is 
you know, classically they will show that, but as I said, it's ever so slightly to the left, the aorta to the pulmonary artery, but for you guys to remember is left of the pulmonary artery and anterior is going to be the LTGA. They're trying to get to you to diagnose congenitally corrected transposition. So here, now, I think this will be a good one to show. So this is where you're used to see the left ventricle. But remember, quick view, smooth septum here. So that makes it the left ventricle here, right ventricle. So that's where the difference is. Of course, the pulmonary veins are coming back into this atrium, so it's left atrium. So this is a kind of picture that you might see in somebody who never had any correction because nobody was picked up. And then you see that the right ventricle is struggling and then you go, hmm, this one is the right ventricle because I had remembered somebody saying that if there's dense attachments. So here is LA, RV, RA, LV. So that's a congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries. That is the picture that one would show. I think this will be the main picture one would show uh, for congenitally corrected transposition. As you can imagine, you know, the operation is going to be you know, making a atrial switch and an arterial switch. It's a double switch procedure to correct congenitally corrected transposition to make it not only physiologically correct, but both physiologically and anatomically correct. You have to do the double switch. And um, here I'm trying to just show you a good MRI picture showing that the posterior ventricle has attachments, hence, it's the uh, right ventricle, you can see the veins coming back, pulmonary veins, left atrium. So left atrium, right ventricle. I was also talking to you about the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Remember that's left ventricle. So the outflow is gonna come here. And the reason I was telling you that obstruction happens is because the right ventricle is the systemic ventricle and the septum bows into the left ventricular outflow tract here. And hence the left ventricular outflow tract is gonna be a problem here. So when I say left ventricular outflow tract, I'm talking about the morphologic left ventricle, but it's actually going into the pulmonary artery. Whenever we say LVOT, it is always going out of a morphologic LV, wherever that LV could be. So that's one of the um, things about uh, congenital uh, stuff. Same thing here, the septal uh, configuration is actually, if you do a short axis view in the um, echocardiogram, it will be uh, horizontal rather than the usual, the way you're used to. So if you see a septum that is actually in a very different plane, when you do a short axis and you're getting the exact picture, think of uh, CCTGA. And the same thing here, I'm showing you how the septum gets pushed in. And um, so those actually are the most commonest that boards and other things will ask. A few words about these things, uh, I think is good to know, truncus arteriosus has one trunk coming off on top of a VST sitting here. And this trunk has to give rise to the coronary arteries, has to give rise to the pulmonary arteries and to the aorta. So that's the definition of a truncus arteriosus. Dejard syndrome, as I said, any of those. So here I will play, it's a subcostal view, left ventricle and giving rise to two here. So this valve here is the truncal valve. We do not call it aortic valve because it's really not an aortic valve itself. It's a truncal valve. So one has to know that when we talk about the truncus arteriosus patient who had one. The reason that is important is that truncal valve does not behave like an aortic valve. It behaves not so good in the sense that they're usually thickened and um, they are prone for both stenosis and regurgitation. And that is actually a complication and not so good thing about the truncus arteriosus. So that is one thing to know. Second thing to know is they might ask the question of uh, what is the commonest morphology of a truncal valve? Is it tricomissural? Is it quadricuspid or is it bicuspid? Or is it, you know, five leaflets? The answer is it's still tricomissural but the quadricuspid aortic valve, if you see, it's most commonly seen in truncus. So that's one of the other twisting questions. So that's things to know about the truncal valve. And the truncus it always sits right on top of the VST. Here, you see the aorta coming off here, truncal valve. And then this is a pulmonary artery coming very close 
to the valve here. So, but this is actually the pulmonary artery with the patent ductus arteriosus and hence it looks big. But uh, coronary arteries come off here, aorta comes off here and pulmonary artery comes off with just one trunk. And that's how you differentiate this from the pulmonary atresia that we had seen before uh, if we had to differentiate this. And uh, same thing here in kind of, uh, kind of a parastonal long axis view. Here is the truncal valve and you see a beautiful aorta coming out and this is the pulmonary artery coming out. So that's the truncus before repair. And of course it can come in various uh, flavors. When I say that here, you see that the aorta is quite big and nice and it comes here and then the pulmonary artery that comes off right above the truncal valve is okay. However, here the aorta is smaller and the pulmonary artery is bigger. And so the spectrum you can go from there to there to actually the next level where the aorta is actually interrupted. That means there's no more connection of this aorta to the descending aorta and the patent ductus arteriosus has to supply. So the one thing to know about Trunkel's uh, patients is that uh, aorta can come in various forms of hypoplastic all the way to interruption. The repair of truncus arteriosus, since we know there is a VSD that sits right below the truncus, you need to do a baffle in such a way that you want to let the left ventricular blood go into the aorta slash the one which used to be the truncus, take off the pulmonary artery from where it used to be, take it off there and insert a conduit from the right ventricle to the PA. So truncus arteriosus patients are somebody that you, you will see because they will need RV to PA conduit revisions, right? They can have residual VSD, but this is important. Unlike a pulmonary artery stenosis, they will not have in a tetralogy follow. Truncal valve stenosis and regurgitation, but this is where I think some of the pictures can be shown that the RV to PA conduit, you have to pick up that there is stenosis and that's what they're getting at so that they can come back for a revision. Total anomalous pulmonary venous return, um, TAPVR. This is the uh, operation that results in a success almost all the time. And hence the residual problems are very less and they might be lost for uh, um, follow-up and you might not see once in a while. So, but to know for boards, there is the supracardiac type, the pulmonary venous confluence sits behind the left atrium and then it has to aggress somewhere. So it's a vertical vein goes comes and makes it to the innominate to the SVC. That's why it's called supracardiac. If that uh, four veins, which comes to the back of the left atrium, finds the coronary sinus to drain, and then drains into the coronary sinus, which we all know drains into the right atrium, then it becomes the cardiac type. And then the infracardiac type is through a vertical vein that crosses the diaphragm, goes down, and enters one of the veins that it can find, which could be IVC, it could be hepatics, or it could be portal vein, or it could be ductus venosus. What are all the things that you need to know for uh, yours? Probably this one, supracardiac type. And uh, you can see a little bit of uh, LV. This is uh, stuff and you can see there is actually a, this is right atrium, left atrium, the confluence is behind. Here in a short axis, this is iota, that's pulmonary artery. You will see that there is a confluence here that goes up to the vertical vein here and then makes it to the innominate and would come back here. And for all these lesions, when they're born, remember there's no blood going into the left atrium. So somehow it has to make it to the right atrium and to make it to the left ventricle for the body to get, it has to be an obligatory right to left shunt. So if they are showing some picture, I would not think they would show, but if they show an obligatory right to left shunt in a patient, with two ventricles they are showing you, it's a total veins. That's the only thing to remember here. And this is a recent one that we did showing that's the vertical vein, innominate, SVC. And you, when I say all the veins come back to the back here and then make it here. The repair is pretty easy. You just uh, anastomose the common pulmonary vein or the confluence back into the left atrium. So of course, when you follow up, there could be problems with this anastomotic site, which might need ballooning if you can get through making a septal perforation on the atrial septum and making it here. So that's one main thing. 
Uh, other than that, usually it's not that big a problem for total veins. Yeah, and MRI is a good way to figure these things out. Echo is good for a gradient for anastomosis. And miscellaneous, we are coming. You know, I think this is one thing uh, you guys probably see it yourself. Uh, but uh, just to show the pictures here, when we see, this is your uh, ventricle here, but the tricuspid valve is way down here. And this is the atrialized portion of the right ventricle, big right atrium, so the Epstein's anomaly. Obviously, Epstein's anomaly can have WPW by itself. So passed on long axis, you know, this is part of the eustachian valve that's hanging out here. I think people probably will have a question what that is. So that's eustachian valve, but you can see the septal leaflet. So the typical description would be apical displacement of the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve and redundant or sail-like anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve that goes into the right ventricular outflow tract. If you see those terms and a picture like that, the answer is clinched on uh, Epstein's anomaly. And of course, they can have a lot of tricuspid regurgitation or no regurgitation. If you are seeing them at that age, obviously they did well. So probably they did not have that much of an issue or it was moderate tricuspid regurgitation had all their life and starts having atrial arrhythmias. And now you see them and clearly figure out that they might need some kind of a procedure done. Uh, Inflow outflow view, we like this sometimes to show that the anterior leaflet can go all the way up into the right ventricular outflow tract, RA, RV, pulmonary valve, and this is that kind of inverted short axis, if you may. Same thing here, tricuspid valve septal leaflet should have been here, but you can see it here, it's displaced that way. So the last uh, thing uh, as we kind of winding down, a single ventricle, what do you guys have to know? They're not gonna ask too many complicated questions. And in the board, actually, they, they actually even said that they might not even have any for echo boards. But if they show a picture with only one ventricle and another one hypoplastic, they are dealing with some kind of uh, single ventricle. So you don't have to know the specific thing of double inlet, left ventricle, all that stuff. So just in, try to show or see you know, if they're trying to show only. It can be this, where this is right. So it could be hypoplastic right ventricle, big left ventricle, or they can be dealing with a hypoplastic left and a single right ventricle. So these are all falls into single ventricle physiology. And of course, the ventricle, there's gonna be only one functioning ventricle. And the operations I went through is the Norwood bidirectional glen and the fontan. So the Norwood procedure is basically, there is only, this used to be the aorta and this used to the pulmonary artery. So they combine that in such a fashion they can make this. So the ventricle pumps out into one artery, but of course you don't have a pulmonary artery blood flow if they do this. So you drop in a shunt either in the form of a BT shunt from this arch to help the pulmonary arteries get blood or you put in an RV to PA conduit called as the Sano shunt here. So those are the names that you hear. They would have already had this, but I think it's just to know. And then when they get to six months, three months, we put a Glen, which is uh, the SVC, gets hooked up to the uh, pulmonary artery here. And in this particular patient, you know, he also has a left-sided superior vena cava, where you guys call it as a persistent left superior vena cava. If that's the case, you need to have both of them hooked up to the pulmonary artery. And we call it the bidirectional Glen because the blood here can go both ways. And in this case, we will call it bilateral bidirectional Glen. And the fontan is IVC make a conduit, usually right now, we will put it outside the heart and, uh, and join it to the pulmonary artery. If you see variations of this in patients that have already been done, it could be baffled through the atrium, using the atrium as part of it, and the atrium gets boggy and they have atrial arrhythmias, and that's a problem. And this is a completion of everything. This is your uh, Glen, this is your Fontan, and so that's a completed patient, showing all the uh, stuff around. So in terms of the checklist, you know, it's a long uh, exhaustive checklist. Uh, I don't need to go through all that, but it just goes by to say what were the things that were done and what we are looking for. And that's, uh, you know, that's the big list of things, uh, not echo per se guided, but it'd be good to see. So I'll leave it there. If it's recorded, people can read it there.
I uh, thank you for you guys uh, listening and uh, I'm sure there are questions uh, coming my way. I hope I can answer them. I can uh, either open the chat box and start reading myself. Is that uh, is that something uh, I do or? Uh... Dr. Ashwat, I can uh, go over the questions with you. I saw four questions in the chat. Could you repeat the first part of the Restelli uh, procedure? Uh, yeah. So the Restelli procedure is, for example, let's say there is an iota that sits a little bit away from the left ventricle and there's a VST below it and there is pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary atresia, for example. Then what you want to do is you want to make a baffle from the LV using the VSD and then hooking up to the aorta. When you do that, you might not be able to use the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery pathway because you either used a baffle or the pulmonary artery stenosis was so bad that you put in a special right ventricle to pulmonary artery conduit. So you preserved the two ventricle physiology. You also did not have to disturb the aorta coming off uh, of the RV with coronary arteries. So the Restelli procedure is done in such a way that you do not have to get the aorta transected and put it back. Sometimes let's say there is a little bit of transposition, for example, double outlet right ventricle with kind of a little transposed arteries. So there, instead of doing a switch, you can try to baffle the LV through the big patch into the aorta that sits a little far away but you might not be able to do RV to PA and use an RV to PA conduit. And that is, uh, um, that's the Rastelli. Okay, so next question is for the lectures from previous weeks, the slide from all the lectures haven't been posted. Can we expect more? Okay, I think that is answered already. Please explain the orientation of uh, short axis in TGA. So uh, here, that might be either uh, before I started or no. But um, so uh, iota and pulmonary arteries, remember pulmonary artery is always, uh, pulmonary artery is always to the back and uh, posterior. And I think maybe people already had the answer. I don't know, maybe we'll see one more time, doesn't hurt. Okay, here. So that's, uh, that's the relationship here. Here, so if you see this in the short axis, anytime iota is anterior to the PA, that is the uh, transposition. And if it is to the right, it is uh, D. And if it is to the left, it is uh, EL transposition. So here, here, so that's the iota anterior to the pulmonary artery because this is anterior, posterior, right and left. So it's going to be anterior, posterior, slightly to the right. If you exactly scan and it is a little bit here like so, D transposition, if it's here, L transposition. So that's the uh, picture orientation. Could you explain uh, what the baffle is exactly? Baffle is just a patch. So here, for example, uh, here, I'm just going to take this, uh, even though this is not. So this is, let's say, VSD, and this is iota here, right? So this pulmonary artery, let's forget, was here, somewhere here, stenosis. So you uh, take a patch material here and close the VSD this way. So LV, for example, VSD to the iota you did. And that pathway that you just created by putting this would be called a baffle. So in that case, in this case, in Sennings and Mustards, however, that baffle is basically a different material that you use basically to build the tunnels from where, which ventricle you want to go to which artery or from which vein you want to go. So you're just building tunnels using a material in some cases, or you're just redirecting the flow in some cases. That's, uh, is Epstein's anomaly synotic or asynotic? I thought the latter, I think uh, Lazio is correct. It's a asynotic heart disease, unless in the newborn period, the Epstein's will have what is called as functional pulmonary atresia because the right ventricle is not an efficient pump. So there's all so much of uh, right ventricular dysfunction. There is going to be a lot of right to left shunt across the AST and they are synotic. But uh, Epstein's anomaly does not fall under the synotic congenital. I just put it under the complex heart diseases. But uh, for you guys, it is an asynotic heart disease. Yes, it is synotic if associated with an ASD and associated with uh, RV dysfunction. 
is morphological tricuspid valve epically displaced in CCTGA. So uh, the tricuspid valve is going to be displaced because it uh, follows the right ventricle. So anytime it follows the right ventricle, it's, uh, it is displaced. And uh, yes, in uh, here, I think the picture is right here. So this will be displaced because it's RV and this is tricuspid valve. So for that question, always the uh, ventricle always is married to that valve. So you can't have an RV and a mitral valve. So it has to be RV and tricuspid valve. So that is always, they go hand in hand. It cannot be separated out that way. You can have LA to RV, but you cannot have a valve separated. So in CCTGA, yes, you're right. The tricuspid valve is gonna be a little bit down here, um, just like the normal RV to LV mitral to tricuspid relationship. Okay, so I think those are all the questions I see here. I, um, am I uh, good, Mahi? Yeah, I think you're good. Thank you very much. I don't know if you can hear me. I don't think you could hear Jay earlier. So um, thank you very much, Ravi, for the excellent review and um, really appreciate your contribution to Perfect. the Perfect. Thank you, guys. Lectures. Thank you very much again. So um, I would like to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, Dr. Rani Garg. Dr. Garg is an Associate Program Director at the Cardiovascular Disease Fellowship at Mount Sinai Morningside and ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. And she's also the director of the clinical track of the fellowship program based at the James J. Peters Department of VA Medical Center in Bronx, New York. She received her medical doctorate at Tufts in Boston and trained in internal medicine and cardiology at Mount Sinai. Dr. Garg is a mother of two and lives in New York's uh, uh, Upper West Side. Uh, Dr. Garg was also a speaker for us last week, and she gave us an excellent talk, and we really appreciate her contribution. Uh, she's actively involved with the fellowship program over there, and uh, thank you again, Vani, for doing this. Over to you. Okay, thank you so much for the kind introduction, and uh, my slides from last week, I had an issue with sending them over, but I've been able to do that, so they should be available for anybody who would like them. And... Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can see it. Great. All right. So, um, all right. So today we're going to talk about uh, aortic regurgitation. And uh, just give me one second to take the box away so that I don't see anything else. Okay, wonderful. Um, so today we're going to talk about aortic regurgitation. And uh, what I've done is it's very, very targeted for uh, board review. So obviously aortic regurgitation is a big topic. There is a lot that we could talk about in terms of data, literature. Um, but I really wanted to give you guys which resources are the best to look at and what are the parameters and data points that you'll need to know very well for the boards. All right, so what does the normal aortic valve look like? Now, you know, by this point, I think everyone feels comfortable with that. Um, so a little bit of extra information to give you is that the aortic leaflets are uniform in thickness under normal conditions, except for a slightly more fibrous region at the anatomic midpoint where each of the cusps meet up. And these are called the nodes of, or nodules of Arantius. And so you can see on the slide here when they're closed, there's that little uh, sort of echo dense looking area and when they're open, one of them is more prominent. And if you feel it on dissection specimen, it's, it's very, very clear. What is the structure of the aortic valve in, in uh, normal circumstances? So the normal aortic valve area is somewhere three to four centimeters squared, and the normal opening is around two centimeters. There's multiple portions to the aortic valve, and we've come to understand its complexity more than, than in, you know, in when we first had an understanding of the aortic valve. And so here is a very nice schematic um, from, an, from circulation interventions that shows you the different parts of the aortic valve and the aortic valve sort of apparatus. So the blue line delineates the sinotubular junction, which on parasternal long axis we'll see, and you guys are probably very familiar. There's a crown-like ring to the aortic valve structure that you don't really see. You just know that it's the, the sort of backbone of how the aortic valve is, is supported. There's the anatomic ventricular arterial junction, 
And then there's the virtual kind of ring formation that is essentially the base or the uh, attachments of the aort aortic valve leaflets. And just below that is the aortomitral curtain, which uh, you guys have probably heard. It was whenever we talk about endocarditis and being concerned about the aortomitral curtain involvement. So from my talk, borrowing a slide from last week, uh, what is normal M mode for the aortic valve? So it's a parallelogram in shape with typically a midline closure when it's a tri-leaflet aortic valve. You normally see on the parasternal long axis, the right coronary cusp, the non-coronary cusp. And very important, this will come up several times when you're studying for the boards and in several different capacities that the aortic valve, different from the mitral valve, uh, an aortic, uh, forward flow rather than mitral regurgitation does not include the electrical isovolumetric contraction time or the isovolumetric relaxation time. And that's delineated by the yellow lines here. All right, so here's a lot of information, but basically the point of this slide is at this point, studying for the echo boards, you guys have all seen a tremendous number of transthoracic echoes. And, uh, and you know, sometimes you know exactly what document to refer to. Sometimes you don't have a sense of, you know, what should I be reading? Where can I get some information and sort of hone and detail my skills? And um, so I really wanted to point you guys in the right direction for some of the late bloomers, which I would say was me in fellowship, some of the early bloomers, you, you probably already know this, um, but this is a wonderful document from 2018 ASC guidelines on a comprehensive transthoracic. And as you can see, we look at the aortic valve in many views and we use all modalities of PW, CW, M mode and uh, obtain information in, in all of those views. For TE, again, another comprehensive document from ASC. This is back from 2013. And then a small plug for the University of Toronto's um, online simulator, which you know has was very helpful for me when I was training. I know a lot of my fellows currently use it, and um, it's very good to sort of understand spatial orientation, especially as you transition from really understanding transthoracic anatomy to transesophageal. So the aortic valve, again, everything is similar views to transthoracic, but different in direction because now you're looking at it from the LA as the most close structure uh, versus the chest wall or the RV as the most close structure. And here you get five chamber view, the long axis equivalent, the short axis equivalent, and uh, variations of that as well as the um, deep transgastric view. Now on the boards, they're not going to necessarily ask you these kinds of questions, but they may ask you if you are in a certain view and need to get a better visualization of the short axis on the aortic valve, what would you do? And it would be to clock and anti-flex and you know, be at 40 degrees as the very middle picture is showing you. So they will ask you a little bit of those kinds of procedural questions. All right. So let's go into the four questions that will guide a talk and then we'll go back to those questions at the very end. Feel free to put in answers in the chat or just record your, your answers on your own. So first question is sort of two parts because it goes along with anatomy, which they love. In the mid-esophageal TEE, short axis of the aortic valve, the non-coronary cusp is the most anterior cusp, the left coronary cusp is the most anterior cusp, the right coronary is adjacent to the interatrial septum or the non-coronary cusp is adjacent to the interatrial septum. The second question is what goes along with this figure. This short axis of the aortic valve shows a bicuspid aortic valve, a Lambel's excrescence, a fibroelastoma of the left coronary cusp or a fibroelastoma of the non-coronary cusp. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. A 30-year-old woman is referred for management of a newly diagnosed subaortic stenosis. She is asymptomatic, but during a routine physical exam of a loud systolic murmur was heard. An echocardiogram demonstrated a subaortic membrane with a gradient of 44 millimeters of mercury and, com and concomitant presence of moderate aortic valve regurgitation. The left ventricle is borderline enlarged with an LVF of 57%. At TE, the valve does not appear to be calcified. Which of the following statements is correct? Are correct. The type 
This type of lesion responds well to balloon dilation. The patient should undergo a resection of the subaortic membrane and aortic valve replacement. Careful inspection of the pulmonary valve and the pulmonary artery should be carried out during TEE. Doppler interrogation of the abdominal aorta provides no information in this case. Okay, next question. Which of the following statements regarding aortic regurgitation is correct? A, uh, a PISA radius of 0.8 centimeters with an aliasing velocity of 40 centimeters per second and an, a peak aortic regurgitant velocity of four meters per second is consistent with severe AR. A pressure halftime greater than 250 milliseconds is consistent with severe AR. Vena contracta is best evaluated in the apical long axis view or the use of su suprasternal notch window is not useful in the assessment of AR. Okay, and the last one, I'll give you guys a little bit extra time just to look at the table um, of data as well. While I read the question, a 67-year-old man with aortic regurgitation underwent transthoracic echocardiographic examination. There was no mitral stenosis or regurgitation. The following values were obtained. And I'll let you guys look at the table over here on the left. Uh, based on the aforementioned data, one can conclude that a pressure halftime is cons uh, sorry, pressure halftime is consistent with severe aortic regurgitation. Aortic valve area can be estimated at 220 divided by pressure halftime. Peak left ventricular systolic pressure is lower than the systolic blood pressure. Left ventricular and diastolic pressure is estimated at 10 millimeters of mercury. And the aortic valve area cannot be calculated using continuity because there is aortic regurgitation. So this is one of the questions that, you know, I, I call one of the time questions on the boards. You know, you might have to do calculations. You might have to look at some of the numbers, you know, a few times over. But this is sort of balanced with the questions like the anatomy ones that are sort of like those freebies. You can get them quick once, you know, you know that hard and you know that quick and answer that within four seconds. And then you can take the extra minute that you need for this one or two minutes that you need for this one and sort of um, balance your time during the exam accordingly. All right, so we're gonna go on to the next slide. So now into aortic regurgitation and some background information. So these are two um, very similar drawings. So the, the uh, very wonderful, and I'll reference it several times, um, guidelines from 2017 on, on the, the valve update guidelines from the 2014 document is the picture on the right. It originally came from, came from a, uh, one of the journals in cardiothoracic surgery on the left from 2009. And it's essentially an adapted uh, Carpentier classification for the aortic valve. And so both, both of the charts are the same. I just wanted you to be familiar with what they look like. And essentially it divides up different mechanisms for aortic regurgitation. So this is not something in terms of what type of uh, aortic regurgitation mechanism it is, is. This is not a question that will be asked on the boards generally, but this will get, enhance your understanding of what is happening and when to expect aortic re regurgitation. And, and then on the left slide, you know, what are some of the typical uh, approaches for repair that are still used in cardiothoracic surgery today? So just briefly, the type one is normal cusp motion with functional aortic annulus dilation or cusp perforation. So the cusp perforation really is just that 1D. Type 2 is cusp prolapse, and type 3 is cusp restriction. All right, so now diving straight into aortic regurgitation and ways that we evaluate severity. And so there are several different parameters. They are all wonderfully laid out and listed, very clear in the Zavi et al. document, the JSE, um, JASC 2017 guidelines document. And so what I've done is clipped part of the document out. Highlight, we're gonna highlight for you guys what are the important things to know the differentiating factors and make sure that this is a reference that you guys go back and look at um, while you're studying for the boards and obviously overall in cardiology and, and echocardiography. But again, these documents are just very, very, very important to know for the boards and to know the numbers. So jet width and LVOT diameter. So basically you're comparing the uh, width of the jet 
with the diameter of the LVOT. And so basically the, there's, um, the modality tells you exactly what we're talking about. Optimization tells you which view is ideal. So usually it's in the long axis view because you have the best axial resolution or best depth resolution. And you are basically a close to within a centimeters measurement of the vena contracta and looking at the LVOT itself. And the most important thing to know is what is severe. So on the boards, they will very much let, they will very much help you in the sense that they'll tell you, they'll give you something that's mild or they'll give you something that's severe. Very rarely will they give you moderate, maybe in the occasion of when there's mixed valve disease, moderate AR and moderate AS. But they, the, for the most part, it's really knowing what the difference is between mild and severe, and then knowing that moderate is everything in between. So the jet width greater than 65% of the LVOT diameter would be uh, suggestive of or supportive of severe. And the way I remember it is, you know, it's, it's two thirds. So even though less than 25% is mild, it's pretty close to a third. And you can, you know, visually you get a sense that less than a third, less than 20, less than a quarter is mild, but greater than two thirds is considered severe. And so this very is almost essentially the same idea and concept to the jet area, but here you're looking at the short axis view. So that's really the major difference. The other one is the long axis view, and this one is the short axis view. And you're essentially getting a sense of the regurgitin jet cross-sectional area compared to the LVOT cross-sectional area, or here you're essentially seeing um, the area, the cross-sectional appearance of the aortic valve, and less than 5% is mild. So again, if you don't really see much, it's probably mild. But if you see a lot, it's you know basically more than two-thirds or a cross-sectional area greater than 60%, then it's considered severe. Now, the caveats to that and the, you know, the parts to be um, mindful of is that the direction and shape of the jet may either under or overestimate. So this is something that is sort of indicative, supportive of the information, but not necessarily the sole measure that you would use in terms of diagnosis. diagnosis. All right, moving on to vena contracta. So this is going to be one of the most important aspects of board studying, of assessment of regurgitant lesions, especially MR, here we're talking about AR, and, uh, and knowing what the number of cutoffs are, knowing how to obtain the values, and knowing, um, uh, just sort of knowing the differences between this and the next slide that we'll talk about. But with vena contracta, so mild is less than 0 0.3 centimeters. Severe is greater than 0.6 centimeters, and moderate is in between. So here it's very important because the vena contracta is measured, as we mentioned, in the parasternal long axis view due to the best, best axial resolution. And here your Nyquist is typically at the normal number, so 50 to 60 centimeters per second. It does not need to be shifted here and you actually still get good resolution to be able to calculate your dimension for the vena contracta. It's often easier when you have a zoomed in view, so you can just get more accuracy of your measurement. And um, the pitfalls, as we mentioned here, is that you do need to see where the neck is of the regurgitant flow, so that's the convergence zone. And sometimes it can be problematic if you have multiple jets or if you have a bicuspid valve, and so you have an eccentric jet where you're not visualizing it very well. All right, so the uh, aortic regurgitation proximal flow convergence. So this is essentially if the vena contracta was the neck of the flow convergence, the proximal flow convergence is the semi is the is the um, semicircle or is the hemisphere. And so here you're aligning the flow with uh, with the beam to avoid distortion. And you, again, want to zoom in, zoomed in view. And, but here the difference is, is that you are changing the Nyquist limit to optimize the direction, to optimize the visualization of these hemispheres. And you change the Nyquist limit in the direction of the jet. Now, this is really important, especially when you're going from transthoracic to transesophageal and trying to optimize the image and, you know, reorienting your brain that a lot of the images of what you're seeing are, are inverted or changed from transthoracic because you're looking at the heart from another view. So the main important thing is that here is when your Nyquist is shifted 
And coming later, we're going to talk about what you do with this view and what do you measure and what, what numbers do you need to know and how we use those numbers towards the calculations, which we'll get to in a later slide. All right, so going back again to the talk from last week, a super quick slide on uh, M-mode findings in severe aortic regurgitation. And this is typically more for uh, acute re aortic regurgitation where you have early opening of the aortic valve, early closure of the mitral valve due to the significant mitral regurgitation. And then just for reference, a, uh, an image up on the top right of a normal mitral valve and um, the C point, which is normally the onset of the QRS um, at that point, at that activation. But in the bottom right picture, you can see early closure of the mitral valve with a much earlier C point. All right, and again, going back to um, last week, I did show this for the uh, spectral Doppler portion, but this is essentially the main use of PW. And again, this goes back to the document. And uh, what you do, what, what PW do you use in aortic regurgitation? And it's essentially pulsing the descending aorta. And an important aspect of this is that, oh, I'm sorry. An important aspect of this is that, again, it's a supportive, um, it's a supportive measure, it's a supportive uh, indication. And if you look at the advantages, it'll tell you here that it's more specific if seen in the abdominal aorta. So if you see it in the ascending aorta, um, in the arch, it's at least suggestive of moderate aortic regurgitation. And if you see it in the abdominal aorta, that, that reverse flow is happening all the way down there also, then it's more supportive of severe. And the other important thing to know here, if you look in the pitfalls, is that it definitely depends on the compliance of the aorta because there is some brief reversal that's normal. There can be a little more reversal that happens with older age when you have more stiff aortas. And so again, you can't really take this as a uh, measure in and of itself only, but it's supportive if you do see this on pulse wave. All right, now continuous wave. So here we're looking at pressure half time. So essentially the amount of time it takes for the pressure in the cavity to drop down by half. So it's written in the name for it to be very well understood. If it takes a long time for the pressure to drop to half, that means the flow coming in is not very robust. So if it takes a long time, it can't be that significant in terms of regurgitation. So mild, is a pressure half time greater than five milliseconds. If it's very, if it's severe, a lot of blood is coming back in a very, you know, fast, rapid kind of pace. It will not take very much time for you to get to half the pressure and equilibrate quickly. So your severe number, um, it will be basically your jet deceleration rate or your pressure half time. The density of the jet is important, but it's I find it's, again, it's a supportive factor. It's not necessarily as, um, it, you know, rely, it, it's not it's not sort of the first thing I look at. It's, it's supportive, it's there in the background, but if you have a very clear delineation of your pressure half time, knowing that number is very helpful. And so severe is a pressure half time less than 200 milliseconds. All right, so now I've taken you through all of the sort of smaller parameters of the qualitative data and uh, some of the parameters of the semi-quantitative data. And so this essentially is on the left is the, data, the document on the chart from the 2017 document. On the right is the update from 2020. The good thing is, is there isn't much that's different. They're just all organized in different ways. And so it can feel overwhelming when there are multiple charts and multiple references and multiple updates. But when you sort of take them for what their value is uh, and each separately, they can be very helpful to just reinforce the clarity of the information. So here you basically, um, we've talked about, as I mentioned, the qualitative and the semi-quantitative. And then there are going to be the parameters that will be your calculations. And those are the quantitative parameters. So regurgitant volume, regurgitant fraction, and the EROA, which we're gonna go into detail in some later slides. Now, putting it all together, this is, again, same from the 2017 document, 
for chronic aortic regurgitation and putting all of the information together. So on the left in green, it's the specific criteria for mild aortic regurgitation. And it goes through some of the numbers that we just talked about. On the right in orange or peach, whatever color this is, um, there's specific criteria for severe aortic regurgitation. And again, all the numbers that we just went over. And, and you know, also mentions the PW, uh, the holodiastolic flow reversal in the descending aorta. And then a lot of mixed of colors in the middle, yellow and yellow and peach together is moderate. So again, as you layer on your uh, understanding of aortic regurgitation and honestly any valve disease, one place to start is know what's mild, know what's severe, and then add the layers of complexity of what's going to be moderate or in the gray zone. And especially as you start to be reading independently and being able to decide and discern between moderate or severe. All right, so I just wanted to touch on this very briefly. This is a wonderful document from um, my fellowship program director, Dr. Halperin, and colleagues on, uh, on aortic regurgitation and sort of the natural history over time and the differences between acute AR and chronic AR in your pressure volume loops. And all of this, sort of these conceptual matters are going to be very important when you're studying for your general boards. This kind of stuff won't necessarily come up on the echo boards, except for a few differences parameters between uh, how the LD looks in acute AR versus chronic AR, but I have another slide coming up for that. But essentially, this document takes you through what happens with increased volume that the LV sees over time. And of over time, over time, over time, it'll essentially lead to fibrosis. And the fibrosis is what ends up happening when you have sort of the more end stage burnt out ventricles that we never want to get to. So this is, again, it's a, it's a great um, article. It's a great reference for looking at the, the major, you know, sort of um, explanations in terms of the natural history of aortic regurgitation. And then on the right, the differences in uh, your pressure volume loops with normal a larger uh, volume that comes with acute AR and then an even larger volume that comes with um, chronic AR and the difference that you get between the aortic and LV uh, and diastolic pressures. So here are the key points that um, will be very relevant for, relevant for the uh, echo boards. So differentiating between chronic aortic regurgitation and acute severe aortic regurgitation. So first on the left for chronic AR, the severity of, and the grading of the severity is a combination of the factors that we've talked about and that we're going to continue to address. So structural, qualitative data, quantitative data, and semi-quantitative parameters. The jet is often visible in all views. The um, assessment of left ventricular size and function is very important and in chronic. As you can even see from that pressure volume loop, it tends to be more globular and dilated. The ejection fraction may fall, which is a later finding, and hope you're in, hopefully your intervention happens before that occurs. And the normal chamber volumes are unusual with chronic severe AR. So if you have a normal size cavity and normal volume, it's less supportive of this being severe and chronic severe AR. Conversely, aortic regurgitation that is acute and severe is diagnostically much more challenging Color Doppler can have a short duration. The patient can be tachycardic and unstable. There's low aortic regurgitation velocity sometimes and an eccentric jet, depending on the pathology. The left ventricle is typically not dilated because something suddenly happened where the valve is incompetent, the artery is incompetent, something happened and all the blood is going backwards. And the M mode findings for the aortic and mitral valves that we went over are typically more seen in acute severe. And then of course, when you don't have um, enough data that in, explains everything or there's something that's discrepant, there's a very low threshold for a transesophageal echocardiography because you have a much better visualization. So these are key points to sort of differentiate between is this something that just happened and you need to have a high level of concern or is this something that's been going on for some time and you've been monitoring it. All right, so now moving on to specific diseases. So pulling this again from the 2017 document, these are the general etiology and mechanisms of aortic regurgitation separated into groups. 
And now we're going to go through some examples. I have so all of the examples I sh I'm going to show you are from my previous job or my current job, and um, it's just wonderful in the in the educational sense. Obviously, not in the patient you know patients dealing with these kinds of issues, um, but to be able to see you know true examples of all of these. I, I wasn't able to find an example for every single one, but a fair number, and also the sort of the key ones that you'll see on um, the exam in terms of questions. So similar to what I did last week, I'm going to show you guys the images, you know, feel free to put in the chat if you know the diagnosis or if you want to guess what it is or just look along and then I'll give the um, answer image of the image at, afterwards. So here, oops, one second, I'm sorry. There we go. Um, so here we'll have these play again. And on the left, you have a transthoracic view. On the right, you have a transesophageal view. And what I did on the bottom left and the bottom right is the bottom left is a very nice schematic of what the view looks like. So looking at the uh, right coronary cusp, left coronary cusp, and the non-coronary cusp, which is along the interatrial septum, that whole thing is flipped when you're in a transesophageal view because your RVOT, your RV is on the bottom furthest away from the probe because now you're looking at the LA side. And uh, so the left blue diagram is what you're seeing on transthoracic. If you take the diagram from the bottom and flip it upwards, that's what I've done on the right side. And that's essentially what you're doing on a transesophageal view is everything is flipped and inverted. And so this is important for where your left circumflex is, where your left atrium is, where your cusps are, and understanding that that understanding sort of that difference in transthoracic and transesophageal echocardiography. So someone mentioned this in the chat. This is a bicuspid aortic valve. And so to go into a little bit more detail, these are some of the key points that will be pertinent in terms of the kinds of questions they can ask you on the exam. So there's there tends to be a male predominance, two to one in terms of ratios. One to two percent of the general population, and as one of our previous speakers mentioned, this is a, one of the most common congenital heart diseases. Most common is the right coronary and left coronary fusion. And so that happens in about 40 to 50 percent of bicuspid valve cases. Non, uh, right coronary and non coronary is the second most common with 32 percent. And then you can actually have a non RAFE. Uh, bicuspid valve where you just have an anterior and posterior leaflet about 14%. These tend to have an eccentric closure line because of the orientation of the aortic valve. This is important. The diagnosis is in systole. In diastole, the valve is closed. So you may see the raffe and misconstrue that for a separated cusp. But in systole, you will see, as in the previous image on the moving images, in systole, you'll very much see sort of that football kind of appearance of the valve when it's open. Transthoracic is 92 and 97% in terms of its ability for detection. If there's ever a question, you can go to another imaging modality or transesophageal echo. 50% have an associated aortopathy. So here's a patient that we had taken care of who has a root dilation as well as the bicuspid aortic valve. And so these numbers are sort of your general general sense of if bicuspid, 5% will have coarctation, and if coarctation, 50% will have bicuspid. So if you see a coarct, you go back and make sure you double look at the aortic valve and whether or not it's tri or bicuspid. All right, so here's a series of, I think I did three slides of this, um, this next pathology. So unfortunately, I don't have moving images for everything. Some of these are our still images, but on the top left, you have the parasternal long axis. On the right is the short axis. And on the uh, bottom left is the suprasternal notch uh, Doppler interrogation. And on the right is, and so that's giving you your peak velocity for the across the aortic valve. And on the right is your regurgitation velocities, your CW. Okay, we'll go to the next view. So again, I apologize, it's not a moving image, but it's more of a still image to show you the vena contracta. So as you notice, we're at a normal Nyquist limit. The uh, vena contracta, if you look around the measurements of, of the um, key on the right, then you'll see that it's close to, almost close to a centimeter, at least 0.9 in size, 0.8 in size, uh, with significant regurgitant flow. And now here's some moving images.
if I can get this one to play. There we go. Okay, so what is this one? This is a quadricuspid aortic valve. And the most important thing about quadricuspid, you know, part of the conversation and the topic that we're doing is aortic regurgitation. So these patients typically have aortic regurgitation. Why? If you look on the left, the valve closes and there's a gigantic hole still because the four leaflets do not co-opt in a nice uh, crisp way the, the tri-leaflets do. And they have nodes of Arantius, but they're not going to be able to meet each other in a nice triangular shape to create a good lock and seal. So then you end up having significant aortic regurgitation. So this is a very sweet patient I took care of. Um, and on the right is her uh, surgical pictures and when she went for uh, valve replacement. So quadricuspid aortic valve has no gender preference. It's associated with aortic regurgitation, as we mentioned, associated with anomalous coronary arteries in about 10% of cases. Now, again, quadricuspid aortic valves are quite rare. So the percentage uh, association with an anomalous coronary artery of 10% probably is um, in the order of very common because quadricuspids are very rare. And just for completion's sake, I included her EKG, which um, doesn't have tremendous you know, glaring abnormalities. Some T-wave inversions you can see anteriorly. All right, moving on to the next one. So on the left, you can see there's a small, like mild sort of very insignificant amount of aortic regurgitation, but there's also a flow connecting between the LVOT and the RVOT. So this is a transesophageal view of essentially the equivalent of a parasternal long axis where you have the LA on the top, the mitral valve is opening up just outside the triangle, the aortic valve is what's uh, visualized, and then the RV is on the bottom. On the right is the Doppler going through and you see a high velocity uh, systolic flow. And so this is a ventricular septal defect. So here essentially is the subarterial or the outlet VSDs that have prolapse of the aortic leaflet into the defect, which causes malcoaptation and causes regurgitation. Now, this was a very young, uh, young gentleman who has known about this VSD for life and has just been having surveillance echocardiograms. And I think this was maybe his second transesophageal echo to confirm that there was no change in terms of sizing, in terms of hemodynamics, and especially in terms of the amount of aortic regurgitation. Um, did my screen just disappear? Yes, uh, it did. you might have to share your screen again. Huh, oh, that's strange. My whole thing closed down. I'm sorry, guys, give me one second. My presentation was extremely excited about that VSD, and so it just emotionally left. Okay, let's get back to Zoom. Okay, can you guys see it? Yes. Wonderful. All right, so that was a ventricular septal defect. Now here, what do we see here? So transesophageal echo, we are in the uh, five chamber view or LVOT view, and you see a very distorted looking aortic valve. You see a long uh, independent motion structure, and then you see significant aortic regurgitation. So this one is endocarditis with valve destruction. I'm sure uh, this is pretty, pretty common everywhere and uh, can have catastrophic sequelae. And then this is what I was mentioning before about uh, making sure that the uh, full assessment of the aortomitral curtain is done as well. All right, so what do we see here? So there's a lot of words. There's some great pictures. Um, I sort of give it away in the description, but and I give it away with the arrow as well, um, but it's a great visualization of a subaortic membrane. And so we'll go through some of the important points for you guys to know. So 
This typically is a discrete fibrous membrane, about 90% of cases. So the majority are that. 10% can be a muscular narrowing of the entire LVOT. Most common associated lesions are PDA, VSD, coarctation of the aorta, and pulmonary, vein stenos uh, pulmonary valve stenosis. So again, very important to understand that knowing about the subaortic membrane and typically what we're taught is high velocities, so something that seems like aortic stenosis, but has a totally normal opening functioning aortic valve, your concern then should go to, is there a subaortic membrane? And that membrane also, the presence of that membrane is associated with these other anomalies. So you have to go and interrogate the other structures and make sure that you're not missing something else. The treatment is surgical. And uh, it usually is when you're symptomatic with a peak gradient to the LVOT peak gradient of 50 millimeters of mercury or more. The peak LVOT gradient is less than 50 millimeters of mercury, but there is heart failure or ischemia explained likely by this obstruction. And uh, if you're asymptomatic with mild aortic regurgitation and a peak gradient of 50 millimeters of mercury or more. So essentially what happens is the membrane causes turbulent obstructive flow. And so you get a high gradient, a high gradient in the LVOT. But that causes destruction of, over time of the aortic valve because of the turbulence within sort of the junction between the membrane and the aortic valve. And that causes aortic regurgitation. So once you start to see high velocities and you see aortic regurgitation, you know eventually the, the valve will become so compromised and you want to essentially spare the valve and go in and do a discrete resection of the membrane. So that would be the time to intervene. And again, referencing back to last week, the M-mode presentation, um, we showed an image of a subaortic membrane and how it has that abrupt early systolic closure and then you know, going along with the mechanism, fluttering of the aortic valve leaflets due to aortic regurgitation if it's present may lead to malcoaptation of the aortic valve leaflets and, uh, and regurgitation. All right, so I'm going to let these play. All right, so this is one of those uh, feared pathologies um, very difficult to diagnose sometimes depending on the clinical scenario. You have to have a high level of suspicion for sort of those never miss moments. And on echo, it's really tough because unless you have a high suspicion of why this looks weird, you may not realize that this is acute severe aortic regurgitation from a dissection. So in the left non-color image, you see some sort of movement that's within the uh, aortic root. It's not very well defined. In the middle image, you see a very eccentric, sort of broad looking aortic regurgitation, which looks pretty significant, but again, you don't have a great visualization of it. And on the right, you have a short axis view, which almost makes it look like it's just a little bit of commissural or you know, not very significant aortic regurgitation. But as you look all of the images in the aggregate, um, then you'll see, you know, then you'll understand that, you know, this is one of those ones where there, there looks like there's some structure in the aortic root. You should sort of have a high suspicion that you see that plus aortic regurgitation. That's a little funny looking, eccentric. And this may be actually a more catastrophic sequelae of an aortic dissection. All right, so moving on to analysis and equations. So this is sort of the bulk of, uh, you know, I think what causes a lot of concern for fellows when they're studying for the boards, understanding the equations, being able to be very adept at them and being able to, you know, not spend long periods of time on the calculations. It's going to happen. It's okay. That's the reason why the exam has a mix of anatomy questions that are easier and calculations that take a little bit more time. But understanding the concepts before you go into the exam and then before you go into doing the calculations will be very helpful. So what is continuity? And you guys have heard this continuity equation, continuity equation a million times. But if you actually sit down and try to understand what it means, it'll, it'll help to, and, and I literally did this when I was studying for the boards as I finally sat down and understood it myself in my words and be able to 
be able to explain it better um, is that it's the conservation of mass. So essentially the same amount that you have in one place will be the same amount that you have in the other place. And so um, the calculations that you use are back to your geometry of area equals volume divided by distance. Area here is the aortic valve area. Stroke volume is the LVOT area times the stroke distance. So again, area times distance for the volume. And uh, the transaortic distance is the is essentially an echo uh, given to you as the VTI or the velocity time integral. The Bernoulli equation is different. It's the conservation of energy. And so when you simplify it, you're basically looking at how pressure and velocity are related. So a change in pressure is equal to 4V squared. And if you account for, um, you have to account for the v velocity in the LVOT when it's greater than two meters per second. So the simplified version is basically saying the LVOT velocity is probably low. And so you can take that as a zero and then just do 4V squared of, of what you're calculating. And then lastly, flow convergence. So we mentioned this on one of the previous slides that as blood approaches a regurgitant orifice, its velocity increases forming concentric, roughly hemispheric shells of increasing velocity and decreasing surface area. So that's a lot of words, but what does it basically mean? Like the sort of those Russian dolls where you have a larger size and then a smaller and a smaller and a smaller and a smaller, the larger one is going to have, uh, you know, high velocity, larger surface area, and then it's going to go down as you go closer to um, the the sort of uh, the neck of the regurgitant flow. So these are sort of the three guiding principles in terms of how your calculations will be used and when you will use which calculation. So let's spend a few minutes on this slide, which is the flow convergence method. And again, going back to the 2017 document, I pulled the images so that you guys could be familiar with them and then broke it down into some of the specifics. So the effective regurgitant orifice area is the EROA. It's essentially the area of the gap, area of the hole where the blood is able to leak back through. And if it's big, that means the flow is going to be allowed to go through a big hole and then you'll have a more regurgitation. If it's small, then there will be less. And how do you figure out that EROA? You're essentially making ratios between the shells, the hemispheric shells, and the circle of the um, hole that the blood can go through. And that ratio is where you have on the right this A1V1 and the uh, A2V2. So so if you look at the image on the bottom, you're essentially the flow convergence is where you have, you have to have a way of designating these shells. And so the only way to designate the shells in echo is by using your color Doppler and then using your, um, your flow velocities to say that at this color, I'm assigning you this velocity. And when you shift your Nyquist in the direction of the jet, that's what essentially what you're doing is you're assigning the velocity to the color and that velocity then will give you the um, the flow the velocity at that of that blood of the blood going through the orifice, and then also the distance that it's traveling to be able to give you the um, the shell the hemispheric area. And then on the right, you'll see that those two should be equal the the hemisphere that you've created as well as the regurgitant orifice. So in the hemispheres and where when you get the area, it's two pi r. So 2 pi r, if you look at the top right, this is the way that you sort of understand where the calculation comes from. You then um, derive the, you know, you understand the derivation of it. Then you do the math and then you do the math in the easiest, fastest way possible. And then you memorize that number so that you can do it on the exam. So 2 pi r squared is what you're going to get, is what the equation you're going to use for the area. 2 pi is 6.28 r squared. R is going to be your PISA radius. And so then this, the 6.28 PISA radius squared times your Nyquist, which is going to be a velocity, divided by your peak aortic velocity, your centimeters per second cancel out, and then you're left with your area, which is a uh, centimeter squared. So wh which numbers do you use when? Um, I think it's it's more clear with uh, the flow convergence and PISA with mitral regurgitation because you're only taking the peak velocity of the MR signal. 
In aortic regurgitation, it can sometimes be confusing because do you take the first one or do you take the second one? Do you take the initial regurgitant velocity or do you take the last portion? But you do for different reasons and for different hemodynamic measurements. So here, your peak aortic velocity is what's circled in yellow. And that is what's going to be the denominator of the equation to give you your EROA calculation. So here's a, a visual example of an aortic regurgitation case where the Nyquist is shifted in the direction of the uh, flow. And you see a very nice uh, shell that's made with the sort of color designated in the blue yellow interface. And if you measure that distance from that point to the valve leaflets, you'd be able to get quite a significant PISA. Okay, so the second part in terms of the quantitative measures is the stroke volume method. And this is one of those board question calculations because they really want you to, they really want to drive in the understanding of stroke volume and what stroke volume is and how you calculate it. And, you know, to be honest, in the echo lab, we, we don't use this one as often because it does involve a lot more assumptions and, and a, a lot more measurements, especially the um, distance for, the, for the, the diameter for the mitral annulus. But it can be useful, especially when you don't have a clear under, you know, you, you, there's some discrepancy in your data. And so then you want to go to the next step of being able to uh, assess the severity in a more uh, quantitative way. So the concept comes back to the volume through the mitral valve is representative of the quote unquote full amount. So the, and this is assuming that the mitral valve is not regurgitant, is, so that the mitral valve is competent. And there's only one problem, which is the aortic regurgitation. So assuming that the blood that goes from the LA to the LV is gonna go through the mitral valve and that same blood should go out the LVOT. Now, that's what happens in diastole. It'll go from the LA to the LV. But also in diastole, what's happening? Aortic regurgitation. So all of a sudden now, the LV has blood coming in from the LA through the mitral valve and also coming backwards from the, through the LVOT. So the volume through the LVOT then will be that blood that went backwards and the blood that came forwards from the, uh, from the LA and all of that now going through the LVOT. So it's going to see the summation of both. And that's what's written here. So stroke volume across the mitral valve plus the regurgitant volume will be what you see through the going through the LVOT or the stroke volume through the LVOT. Now you rearrange those numbers and you get the regurgitant volume equals the stroke volume through the LVOT minus the stroke volume through the mitral valve. Stroke volume, as we've gone back to uh, understanding the continuity equation, is pi r squared times stroke distance. And then I've taken out the derivation of the pi r squared. So pi r squared is pi times diameter divided by two. So r essentially is diameter divided by two. And then you square that. Now, when you're doing the LVOT, you don't have a radius, you have a diameter. So that's the reason why the pi r squared gets re rearranged and derivated as a diameter number. Then you can do pi times diameter squared divided by four, pi divided by four is 0.785 times diameter squared. So then for the exam, you understand that whole derivation, you've come to understand what continuity is, you understand that for stroke volume, you're looking at pi r squared, and you're looking at areas time distance, and then you, will be, you can use the numbers of 0.785 d squared or 0.785 LVOT diameter squared. So the next slide, and then on the bottom here, um, and then the, ne the next slide will explain this more in detail, but on the bottom here, you're looking at, as I mentioned, the stroke volume through the mitral valve. So you have to have the diameter of the mitral valve, you have to have the VTI of the forward flow, and then use those same numbers in terms of the calculations for your stroke volume. So the next slide takes us through everything in detail. So this was uh, a slide borrowed from one of my fellows, and um, very, very, you know, uh, wonderfully depicted how to go through each step of the calculation. So calculating the LVOT stroke volume. So you need the LVOT area times the VTI, which will give you the uh, area times distance will give volume. Then you do the same for the mitral valve. So the area times distance will give you volume. As we mentioned, the LVOT volume minus the mitral 
uh, valve stroke volume will give you your regurgitin volume. So skipping the bottom left picture for a minute, that same uh, volume then divided by a distance will give you the area, so the EROA, and then the regurgitant fraction, we'll go over that uh, in, I think, the next slide as well. But essentially, the regurgitant fraction is the amount of blood that is the what was regurgitated, so the volume of the AR, divided by the volume that went out as it should, the LVOT, and that gives you the regurgitant fraction. So now looking at the bottom left slide, this is essentially getting to your information and numbers in a different way. So either you could go steps one through five to get to the regurgitant volume and then be able to calculate your regurgitant fraction, or you can use your EROA and multiply that by VTI. So again, area times distance and give yourself the volume. So there's two ways to get to the volume. It depends on if you are using just stroke volumes and comparisons that way, or if you are using areas and distance. So again, going back to putting everything together, this, these are the slides that, uh, again, go back to the 2017 guidelines and the 2020 guidelines, the grading of the severity of chronic AR with echocardiography. We went over qualitative Doppler, semi-quantitative parameters and the quantitative parameters. And on the right is very clearly delineated what you have for mild AR, moderate AR and severe AR. So the same numbers that you see in the 2017 chart are there in the 2020 chart. It's just organized for you in a different way and uh, organized sort of horizontally versus vertically, but essentially showing you that these are quantitative parameters that can be calculated, they can be measured, and those measurements can be used for calculations. All right, so what about the second velocity, quote unquote, or the end velocity? So the other concept that's very important in terms of calculations is left ventricular end diastolic pressure. Now, when you study for the boards, there's several ways that you can get your EDP. But specifically, I'll focus here only on aortic uh, regurgitation and how to use that Doppler to figure out EDP. In general, the concept of the pressure in the originating chamber equals 4V squared plus the pressure in the receiving chamber. Specifically here, the originating chamber is the aorta and the receiving chamber is the LV. So that change in pressure is equal to 4V squared. So essentially, you moved the LV the, the aorta minus LV, the change in pressure, taking that part out specifically, is the diastolic blood pressure minus the LV EDP. And then again, rearranging the calculations and trying to eventually get to LV EDP as what you're looking for the answer, equals diastolic blood pressure minus four times the end diastolic peak velocity squared. So here, this is the um, same patient that um, of mine that we take taken care of recently, who had the TE that I showed you guys the PISA his his um, video, and so this is his Doppler where you can see the jet of the aortic regurgitation, both the peak um, flow and then the end diastolic peak velocity, and so if you use this equation to figure out your LV EDP, if his blood pressure is 130 over 40 what would you get as your EDP number? So let's go through it together. Four aortic velocity and diastolic peak velocity squared equals diastolic blood pressure minus LV EDP. I rearrange everything and your LV EDP equals diastolic blood pressure minus 4V squared. So then you put 40 for his, end dias for his uh, uh, diastolic blood pressure minus four times 1.5. So the, the pink dot on the right. 1.5 squared gives you 40 minus 9 gives you 31. So his LVDP is 31. If you are using the, the when you are doing calculations for EDP, you're using the peak and diastolic uh, velocity. If you're doing the calculations as we mentioned before for stroke volume, then you're using the four meters per second. 
And what they'll do on the exam is they'll give you everything like I did here because they want to confuse you and they want to make you pick the right number. And then they'll give you answers that would reflect the four meters per second calculation and answers that would reflect the 1.5 meters uh, per second calculation. All right, so here we're getting to um, just these a very, very quick slide on interventions and when to intervene. So these go back to the 2014 guidelines and then the update in 2020. Essentially, they're the same. The only thing I wanted to point out is that they changed the LVEF from 50 to 55. So very wonderfully in the Mayo videos, when I studied, they gave us the 60-40 you know, rule and the 50-50 rule. Um, but now, you know, now it's 55 and it's just honestly, it's uh, a little frustrating when you're studying, but essentially the concepts are the same. And so being familiar with these documents, again, they, you go into the category of establishing severe AR, symptomatic, you intervene, asymptomatic, you monitor. If they get to any of these parameters, you have, you know, still a one, a one indication for intervention. And then with certain size parameters, you have the 2A indication. All right, so one thing that can come up on the exam is that they'll show you this middle still image and they'll ask you to identify what it is. So this is a mechanical aortic valve. This is a, tilt, a bileaflet aortic valve. And from our talk last week, we saw that the M mode velocity here um, is uh, very, very representative of a mechanical valve. Here you see, and I told you, sort of gave you the answer on the top right, but here you see a transesophageal view in diastole and in systole of, the, uh, of a bioprosthetic aortic valve replacement. And essentially these little white things that you're seeing are the struts. So very, very clear um, delineation of the apparatus of the bioprosthesis. And then, you know, just as an interesting thing, because it's so clearly um, visualized here, is the left main artery on, uh, on transesophageal echo. Okay, so now moving back to the questions since we're wrapping up. In the mid-esophageal view of the short axis, uh, which is true in the, um, of the aortic valve? Okay, so this one is D, the non-coronary cusp is adjacent to the interatrial septum. The short axis of the aortic valve shown here, and what is the true statement? So, you know, test taking skills, it's most likely C or D, um, but obviously that's not always an absolute, but here it's going to be D. Oops, my arrow is missing, there's my D. Um, and so you have the non-coronary cusp at the top, the right coronary cusp at the bottom and the left coronary cusp on the right, because it's a TEE. -E. Uh, the teaching points, uh, the other one I wanted to mention is that the right coronary cusp is the most anterior cusp so on TEE, it's the farthest away from the transducer because the transducer is, is looking at the LA first. And then in for this uh, mini question 18, the teaching points are fibroelastomas or benign tumors seen on the aortic valve, small, well delineated, and can be pedunculated. They're usually less than 20 millimeters in size. They can have stalks, highly mobile, and most important, high embolic risk. You don't just leave them there. You do something about them. A 30-year-old woman, so we'll go through this whole question, essentially a subaortic stenosis, has a gradient, has moderate AR, has a borderline EF, a borderline size, but a normal EF, and which statement is true? So this one can throw people off in it a little bit because you can recognize that there's a subaortic membrane, that she has moderate AR, and so something should be done about it. But one of the main things that I mentioned during the talk is the associations with the other pathologies. And so careful inspection of the pulmonary valve and the pulmonary artery should be carried out during the TEE because as a 30 year old, she would probably do much better rather than a valve replacement, but either a valve uh, sparing and valve repair or some sort of um, some sort of different procedural options, you know, in terms of hopefully if the valve is not too compromised, but even maybe doing a um, uh, in terms of another option for, for her, because it's not treated with balloon dilation, you would not prefer an aortic valve replacement and uh, Doppler interrogation of the abdominal aorta would not give you uh, much information. All right, here we have which of the following statements regarding aortic regurgitation is correct. 
So again, you'd have to either go through the calculations to be able to get to the right answer or look at the other answers and decide whether or not they are true. And so here, the calculations that they would take you through would get you to uh, the EROA calculation. And your answer is A. And the most important thing here is that you have to keep track of your units. So here they purposely give you a Nyquist of 40 and centimeters per second. They purposely give a velocity in meters per second and they expect you to be able to change into centimeters per second, cancel out your units, and then get your EROA and decide whether or not this is consistent with severe aortic regurgitation. And lastly, so this was the super long one, um, before, based on the aforementioned data, one conclude. So the pressure half time here is 656 meters per second. That is not consistent with severe. The aortic valve area is not estimated by the 220 divided by pressure half time. That's for mitral stenosis and mitral valve area. The uh, peak LVEDP is the peak LV systolic pressure. That is not true. The EDP is estimated at 10. And so we went through the calculation on the one of the previous examples. Essentially, that's what they're doing here with giving you the end diastolic velocity of the aortic regurgitant jet is 3.7. So in the calculation here, they gave you the blood pressure, they gave you the end uh, diastolic velocity, they expect you to do diastolic blood pressure minus 4v squared and you get 10. And so D is the correct answer. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Garg. We have two questions in the chat box. Sure. Um, the first one is, what are the conditions in which we cannot use the standard pressure half time to assess AR severity? Um, sorry, let me say that again. What are, can you repeat the question? Yes. What are the conditions in which we cannot use pressure half time to assess AR severity? Oh, okay, no, that's a great question. So one of the main things is when, the best way to think about it is when there is something that's compromising your pressures or your essentially your space into the uh, LV. So when you're looking at pressure half time, it's the, the when you get to half the pressure and the, the difference between the aorta and the LV. So if you have very significant diastolic dysfunction, that's going to uh, incorrectly elevate your amount of pressure in the LV, and you'll actually have a uh, pressure half time that will be slower. So you may not actually see in the pressure half time that you have severe AR. So diastolic dysfunction, especially when you get to more restrictive pathologies, is going to be one of those situations where it's not reliable. The second question was uh, for the PISA method, do the PISA radius and peak AI velocity need to be measured at the same time of the cardiac cycle? Uh, so yes. So in generally the teaching is that in one, in the view that you get a measurement, you should get the other measurements and that all those measurements should be in comparison to each other. So uh, for example, if you're in uh, doing the TE and you're in the apical five uh, equivalent view and you see a very nice PISA and then you are able to get your, um, you, at that time it would be ideal to get your vena contracta, your with your regular Nyquist, your shifted Nyquist and your PISA and your CW through it to get um, all data points and then use all data points to make a calculation. If you're in your parasternal long axis view, which will give you the better axial resolution, um, especially on TE and you get the vena contracta, again, ideally is that you get all the measurements in that same view. And so you can actually do a true comparison because what you don't wanna do is have, uh, and again, sometimes you can't avoid that, and if you have different views, you sort of use an aggregate of your data. But what you don't want to have happen is you're comparing something in one view where you don't see it fully to another view where you see it fully. And so then your numbers are off. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vani. That was an excellent review. Great. You Thank were you, guys. You speaker last weekend and this weekend. We really appreciate your contribution to the lecture series. Uh, truly amazing. Thank you again. So uh, I want to, before I move on to the next speaker, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to show you all again the Iowa ACC website. If you are in fact taking your echo lectures this year, it's kind of a good idea to do your general cardiology board review. 
Uh, we have these lectures recordings from last year, or if you want to look at somewhere else, that's fine too. But it's a good idea to kind of do your general cardiology review. It's on the fellow education and board prep lectures from 2020. Uh, the echo board prep lectures, again, all the recordings and the slides, as long as the speakers give us permission, will be uploaded to the website. Some of them are already there and the others will be forthcoming too. The rest of the schedule is also uh, updated over here. If you have any questions or anything else, again, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, most of the information is provided there. Um, tomorrow we will be uh, continuing mostly on a little more of uh, the basic topics with the physics and 3D echo and contrast echo, those kinds of topics. I'm going to move on now and introduce our next speaker, Dr. Neera Jain. Dr. Neera Jain completed his internal medicine residency in Birmingham, Alabama and fellowship in Cleveland, Ohio, after which he returned home to New Orleans in 2003. He has served as the Cardiovascular Fellowship Training Program Director at LSU Health in New Orleans since 2008 as well as the Internal Medicine Student Clerkship Co-Director. He has an interest in multimodality imaging and fit education. This year marks the beginning of, the, of uh, Dr. Jane's term as the governor of the Louisiana ACC uh, chapter. Um, when we realized that we did not have enough speakers to cover all the topics, I sent uh, a kind of a shout of help to the Board of Governors and Neeraj was kind enough, along with a few others, to kind of volunteer for these talks and uh, accept our invitation. So thank you very much for Neeraj uh, for doing that. And he's going to be talking to us about tricuspid and pulmonary valve disease. Thank you, Mahi. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, on behalf of the Imaging Society of uh, Louisiana Subcommittee of the Louisiana ACC Chapter, it's my privilege to present to you a review of the right heart valves. So let's start with uh, a few questions uh, that we will answer uh, at the end of the presentation. So question number one, unlike the relationship of the mitral and aortic valve leaflets, it is uncommon to see direct extension of tricuspid valve endocarditis to the pulmonic valve due to the presence of what anatomic structure? The moderator band, ventriculo infundibular fold, Crista terminalis, septo marginal band. All right. All right. Next question. Which of the following is least effective in improving right ventricular systolic pressure assessment accuracy from the following TR jet spectral Doppler envelope? Set the sweep speed to 100 millimeters per second, increase the 2D gain increase the dynamic range, administer saline bubbles, or decrease the displayed Doppler velocity scale. All right, next question. Which of the following is correct regarding typical findings associated with Edstein anomaly? Septal and anterior leaflet fusion resulting in tricuspid regurgitation, RV laminated, sail-like anterior leaflet, decreased size of anatomic tricuspid annulus, apical rotation of the functional tricuspid annulus, or increased right ventricular volume. All right, next question. A patient diagnosed recently with a small Anterior leaflet tricuspid vegetation presents for a repeat transthoracic echo. Which of the following views is most likely to show the anterior tricuspid leaflet? RV parasternal, sorry, parasternal RV inflow, parasternal short axis, apical RV focused, apical three chamber, or apical four chamber? All right, next question. What is the cause of the blue Doppler signal in the subpulmonic RVOT region on this transthoracic echo indicated here by the green arrow? Um, A, pulmonic regurgitation with inverted Nyquist. B, PR with too low Nyquist limit and aliasing. C, VSD associated with trisomy 21. D, VSD associated with tetralogy of Fallot or something else, don't know. All right, 
Next question. A 29 year old woman is in her second trimester of pregnancy. Due to systolic murmur and mild exertional dyspnea, an echocardiogram is performed with the following CW tracing across the pulmonic valve. Which of the following correctly characterizes the next step in pregnancy counseling? Continue pregnancy, PS is no biggie, PS gradient warrants balloon valvuloplasty, PS gradient warrants pregnancy termination. What PS? You mean supracrystal VSD. All right, next question. A 30 year old woman is status post at Charles Yo Fuller repair with a with bioprosthetic valve. Images shown are from standard parasternal views. Based upon the images, which of the following is least likely to be found? RV hypokinesis, sinus rhythm, TS and TR, PS and PR, elevated RV EDP, right atrial pressure greater than PA diastolic pressure before the S1 heart sound, or all of the above are demonstrated. All right, the next uh, questions here are just simple true-false questions. Diastolic tricuspid VTI of 30 uh, indicates severe tricuspid stenosis. Tricuspid pressure half time less than 190 uh, milliseconds indicates severe tricuspid stenosis. Or uh, tricuspid regurgitation volume of 50 cc's per beat. Does this indicate uh, severe tricuspid regurgitation? All right. Well, this is the exam content outline from the 2020 exam, and you can see where the tricuspid valve and pulmonic valves fall under valvular heart disease and congenital heart disease, uh, of which we've talked a lot about today. And certainly no discussion of these valves can be complete without talking about the right ventricle. When we, talk, when we look at the natural history of tricuspid regurgitation, we see that as you have mild, moderate, and severe tricuspid regurgitation, regardless of your situation, whether it's left heart disease or right heart failure or whatnot, the mortality increases with the increasing grade of tricuspid regurgitation. This has prompted the development of various devices, which are uh, experimental and, and still in progress. Um, whether these transcatheter approaches uh, to reduce tricuspid regurgitation will be clinically effective remains to be seen. So let's talk about the right ventricular anatomy. There are three parts to the right ventricle. There's the inlet portion, which includes the tricuspid valve, the chordae tendinae, and the papillary muscles. There's the apical portion, which is highly trabeculated. And then there's the smooth outlet or conus portion of the right ventricle. There is a ridge here called the crista supraventricularis that separates the outlet from the inlet portion of the RV. These holes that you see here in this picture indicate locations for VSDs. And so here um, is, are some uh, muscular VSD locations. And then this one here in particular is an inlet type of VSD, one that you might see in Down syndrome. Uh, and then one up here next to the pulmonic valve, these are supracrystal VSDs or outlet VSDs. Uh, the outlet VSD here is one that you might see in Tetralogy of Fallot. So uh, keep that in mind. Further into the right ventricular anatomy, there are three bands. There's the parietal band, there's the septomarginal band, and there's the moderator band of which you know well. The septomarginal band uh, seen here, when this hypertrophies, uh, this can actually uh, create a little division within the right ventricle um, such that there's an, a lower chamber and an upper chamber. And this is sometimes called the doubly chambered right ventricle. There's also a structure called the ventricular infundibular fold. And so here in this blue arrow, if we start in this dark area, this is the fold uh, here. As the fold makes a turn, uh, it is called the super, uh, crista supraventricularis. And this structure separates the inlet from the outlet uh, portion of the right ventricle and thus separates 
the tricuspid from the pulmonic valves. And then as this area continues on, it forms the posterior right ventricular outflow tract. The shape of the right ventricle is quite complex. From the side, it looks uh, triangular, as you can see here. And then in cross-section, it looks crescentic. Uh, importantly, there is no geometric shape that can be used as a model for calculation of RV chamber volumes, especially when you add into that that the shape of the interventricular septum certainly influences uh, that RV volume. Here is a, uh, a, a depiction of the right ventricular volume overload pattern where the sept septum is flattened in diastole, causing a D shape of this uh, uh, short axis view. The right ventricular volume overload pattern is one that is highly testable and you need to recognize it, be able to recognize it well. Uh, so what you will see here on M mode is a paradoxical movement of the interventricular septum towards the LV in diastole when the mitral valve is open. And of course, we can talk about the D-shaped septum in diastole as well. So the list of things that causes this pattern, uh, number one is shunt. And typically it's a shunt before the tricuspid valve level. So things like an ASD or partial anomalous uh, pulmonary venous return. What is not typically seen is uh, the usual VSD or muscular VSD, a PDA or AV fistula would not be expected to cause the right ventricular volume overload pattern, nor a PFO, because generally those are smaller and don't have the volume uh, associated with it. Second on the list, uh, and quite germane to this talk, is severe regurgitation of the tricuspid valve or pul pulmonic valve. Uh, thereby flooding the right ventricle. And then finally, RV myopathies such as RV infarct or arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy or a glycogen storage disease, these can cause uh, the appearance of the right ventricular volume overload pattern. So it's important to recognize. As far as the tricuspid valve and its anatomic considerations, the tricuspid valve is the largest valve in the heart. Uh, the annulus is larger and more complex than that of the mitral valve. The tricuspid uh, leaflets are thinner than the mitral valve leaflets. So when you think about edge-to-edge -edge repair of uh, the tricuspid leaflets uh, with a clip device, that can be a little bit harder to accomplish, especially when considering that the leaflets are of unequal size and there may be two leaflets or four le leaflets as less common variants. The complexity of the tricuspid annulus comes in that it is both simultaneously D-shaped and non-planar with high and low points. So it's kind of saddle-shaped and D-shaped at the same time. And this, uh, this creates uh, some uh, challenge with percutaneous repairs. As the surgeon sees it, uh, there are three leaflets, septal, anterior, and posterior. Uh, and there are two main papillary muscles. The anterior papillary muscle sends uh, good cords to the anterior and posterior leaflet. The posterior papillary muscle is often bifid or trifid and sends cordae to uh, the posterior leaflet and septal leaflet. And a lot of times the septal papillary muscle is very rudim rudimentary or absent in one out of five patients. And in, that, in those cases, there are cords that arise directly from the interventricular septum and insert into the septal leaflet. There can be one of the unique things about the tricuspid anatomy in, in the right ventricle is that there are a lot of uh, false chordae or false tendons that go between the moderator band and, other, and the other bands described or leaflets themselves. And so uh, that is different than the left side of the heart. From, uh, from above, you can see here that the anterior leaflet is the largest and most mobile of, of the three leaflets and the septal leaflet for reasons mentioned with direct insertion of tertiary cords into, this, into the leaflet itself, the septal leaflet is the least mobile. So, because the septal leaflet is buttressed by the interventricular septum, whenever there is right ventricular enlargement, it really has to go out on this uh, free wall side. 
And so the red dashed line shows the direction of chamber enlargement. And then when the chamber enlarges in this direction, you can see that there will be a malcoaptation of the anterior and posterior leaflets because they're pulled out compared to the septal leaflet. It's useful just like on the left side to uh, distinguish uh, primary from secondary uh, tricuspid regurgitation. So primary regurgitation would be things like uh, prolapse uh, or vegetation, carcinoid, rheumatic disease, radiation, any uh, devices like pacemaker uh, or ICD lead devices that lead to TR would be considered primary. Uh, problems like Epstein anomaly also uh, considers primary. And then patients who undergo transplant and, and in the uh, conduction of biopsies, uh, you, the biotome may, may um, damage the tricuspid apparatus that's also considered primary. However, the majority of patients have secondary tricuspid regurgitation. Again, this is another depiction of the way the tricuspid annulus will enlarge uh, in that anterior and posterior aspect uh, or, or relationship with those leaflets. And the pathophysiology of secondary TR is related to two main things that you need to re remember. RV and, and tricuspid annular dilatation is one. Uh, and then in the setting of pulmonary hypertension, there is leaflet tethering. So these are the two things that we're going to assess uh, for patients with secondary TR. And as the tricuspid annulus dilates, the septal aspect is spared. Um, the, tri the annulus becomes more circular and planar, which helps with uh, uh, the, the design of uh, percutaneous devices. Some caveats for secondary tricuspid regurgitation. So in idiopathic uh, TR, the basal RV and the annulus is the one, are the ones that dilate. So you see here in the yellow area, uh, arrows, the dashed line is the annulus and the solid yellow arrow is the uh, basal RV. The green line, which is the RV length, seems to remain normal uh, in these cases. And there's a normal tenting height. However, in pulmonary hypertension with uh, functional tricuspid regurgitation, what happens is that the green line gets bigger. There is lengthening of the RV uh, and not so much basal uh, dilatation or annular dilatation. There is significantly greater tenting height. And where do you look for tenting? So here in the apical forechamber, you can uh, connect the line between the annulus uh, points, insertion points, and then the coaptation point. And then this area here, uh, if it is greater than 1.63 uh, centimeters squared, uh, or if the height uh, shown by this white arrowhead uh, is more than 0.76 centimeters, this uh, portends a, a worse prognosis. The annular diameter cutoff is 44, uh, sorry, 40 millimeters or 21 millimeters per meter squared. So importantly, our understanding of when to intervene on these patients with secondary TR continues to evolve uh, because we have not fully understood the complex relationship amongst the, the RV valve and uh, tricuspid annulus. We're still trying to understand all of those things. So these are the standard tricuspid valve views uh, for transthoracic and transesophageal echo um, that you might find in a textbook. Uh, and there are some leaflet designations uh, listed here. And be very careful about uh, taking this as gospel, just like uh, fellows look at the um, TEE views for the uh, mitral leaflet anatomy, but in real life, 3D is the way to go uh, because it gives you the confidence to, to know what you're looking at. Uh, so similarly for uh, 3D of the tricuspid valve, uh, what we would like to do when we get is, is display an on fast view of the valve. And you can do that either from the RV side or the RA side. But to standardize um, the view, we place the intraatrial septum at the six o'clock or the bottom part of the, of the screen. Since the right ventricle is an anterior structure, transthoracic echo may give you 
better views than TEE uh, for 3D. So on the mitral side, when we do a TEE, we get beautiful pictures of the mitral valve because the mitral valve is in the near field. The right ventricle and tricuspid valves are in the far field and they are subject to the limitations of far field imaging. If you want to look at uh, on transthoracic echo, uh, the closed tricuspid leaflet uh, anatomy, then you use the apical views. On the other hand, uh, during diastole to see the tricuspid leaflet when it's open, the parasternal views are recommended. In 2016, there was a paper that came out uh, where they used the 3D, uh, used 3D echo to verify what we were seeing on the conventional 2D images. And the, one of the important sentences in, from this paper was that three-dimensional analysis in our study resulted in data that challenged the textbooks and guidelines as they demonstrate that it is impossible to predict with certainty the tricuspid valve leaflet combination visualized in any of the standard 2D views. They did offer up uh, six uh, new views, uh, which, were, which are off axis, but uh, give you some chance at giving uh, confidence into leaflet assessment. And we'll take a look at that um, shortly. So here are the standard views. So in the right ventricular inflow view, they found in their paper that 100% of the time you are imaging the anterior leaflet. Um, and then you can see the septal and posterior leaflets uh, are also visualized in this view. In the short axis, suffice it to say that with a mild angulation, you can see each of the three leaflets um, rarely at the same time, but you can find um, each of the leaflets in this view. In the RV focused view, it's a generally a more posterior view and you're seeing the posterior and septal leaflet. Now, recall from, if you recall from last week, uh, it was mentioned that in the apical four chamber, the most common view uh, leaflets that you are seeing are septal and anterior. If you uh, look at this, the most common uh, leaflets seen are septal and posterior. 100% of the time you are seeing the septal leaflet, but probably more often uh, than we recognize, we are seeing the posterior leaflet in that view. So there, there have been other publications like this one in 2007. And when you take textbooks and this 2007 and 2016 publications, there are only two leaflets where there are agree, uh, agreement uh, and, and with regard to the view. So in the apical four chamber view, this leaflet here in the green circle next to the interventricular septum is 100% of the time the septal leaflet. In the parasternal view, uh, in the RV inflow view, this leaflet here in the red circle is 100% of the time the anterior leaflet. Other leaflets may come and go, but these are the only two that uh, with certainty you can hang your hat on. There are some tips in identifying uh, which leaflet you're seeing. So the posterior leaflet is associated with seeing the coronary sinus. The septal leaflet is associated with seeing the left ventricular outflow tract. And the anterior leaflet is associated with seeing the aortic valve. So here's an illustrative case. So here's a patient with um, a big right ventricle. If you look at the interventricular septum, you'll see that there is paradoxical movement towards the left side during diastole, uh, indicative of the RV volume overload pattern. The first thing you should think about is a shunt, um, uh, like an ASD. And, it, and then if we look at the RV inflow, we definitely don't see the shunt, but we see a nice juicy vegetation here. So what leaflet is, is um, involved with this vegetation? Well, in this view, 100% of the time, this leaflet up here with the vegetation is the anterior leaflet. How about this opposite leaflet? Well, what you see here is that this is the liver. So the, the right ventricle is sitting on the, di, uh, the um, hepatic surface or diaphragmatic surface uh, here. You see the coronary sinus. And importantly, what you do not see is the interventricular septum. 
So this leaflet is the posterior leaflet in this view. Uh, suffice it to say, this patient has severe tricuspid regurgitation from this color jet, and let, let's not quibble about that. Um, in this view, at the short axis, you see very clearly the aortic valve. And this is one of the off-axis views that the authors from the 2016 paper suggested that if you can make the aortic valve, uh, sorry, the tricuspid valve one solid leaflet, it's going to be the anterior leaflet. So again, that vegetation is seen on the anterior leaflet and there are two bellies uh, to this endocarditis. If, uh, if you do see a separation in the middle of this leaflet, then this one on the right is still the anterior leaflet and the opposite leaflet is the posterior leaflet in this short axis view. How about in the four chamber? So here in the four chamber, you see this leaflet, which is 100% of the time the septal leaflet the green asterisk indicates the left ventricular outflow tract. And then what you don't see is the coronary sinus. So when you don't see the coronary sinus and you see the LVOT, then this leaflet here is indeed the anterior leaflet. If you receive more of the coronary sinus, this is, would be more likely to be the posterior leaflet. All right. Moving on to a, a congenital disease case. So this is a 51-year-old woman, status post uh, PDA and ASD repair at age 19, who underwent a bioprosthetic T, uh, tricuspid valve replacement at age 47. Unfortunately, four years later, she had dyspnea on exertion and edema. She's got a right bundle on her EKG and her uh, chest X-ray shows some cardiomegaly and the straightening of the left heart border. If we look at uh, the four chamber view here, you'll find that there is some tricuspid regurgitation seen on, on color, as well as this orange flow acceleration uh, across the, uh, the, the valve. The valve is very bright and, uh, and there's no leaflet excursion. And so this is a degenerated um, uh, bioprosthesis. If we look again at, a, at the um, color signal, you can see a flow acceleration, very indicative of significant tricuspid stenosis. Uh, if you look at the CW signal here, uh, you'll find uh, that the mean gradient is 20. I also include here uh, in the, with the purple arrow that the VTI is 121. So uh, sometimes on the echo boards, instead of giving you uh, data like the mean gradient of 20, they only give you the VTI. And they want you to be very facile on the aortic and LVOT VTIs. And they can certainly ask uh, about these uh, parameters uh, for the tricuspid valve as well. This patient did not want to have a third sternotomy. And so uh, in this patient, we elected to put in a melody valve. The melody valve is a bioprosthesis that typically can go into the pulmonic location uh, for, get, for congenital patients, but this patient uh, was able to receive the melody valve in the tricuspid uh, location as a valve and valve procedure. Here's what it looks like. And uh, we found that the mean gradient after the procedure had decreased from 20 to a very acceptable four millimeters of mercury. The criteria for uh, severe TS include a mean gradient above five, a VTI above 60 centimeters, uh, pressure half time greater than 190, and a valve area of one or less. It is very, very important when you recognize that a normal mean gradient across the tricuspid valve is two millimeters of mercury. It's important to recognize that if you have TR that is any more than mild, this will overestimate the severity of the tricuspid stenosis uh, because of, of that extra flow. So when we live in a world of two to three millimeters of mercury or three to four or four to five, a little bit of tricuspid regurgitation can make an, a significant error uh, in overestimating the degree of tricuspid stenosis. When you have TS, balloon valvuloplasty is not recommended for native valves. And if you have severe uh, pulmonary regurgitation. This renders the pressure half time 
for uh, useless uh, as unreliable uh, for uh, tricuspid valve area assessment. Here's another patient with uh, tricuspid stenosis and a mechanical tricuspid prosthesis. You can see that there is very, very little uh, leaflet excursion. Uh, this patient had thrombosis and the guidelines uh, recommend uh, thrombolytic therapy for this. And ne the next day, the patient had a normally functioning uh, tricuspid uh, by, uh, mechanical prios uh, prosthesis once again. Here's another case of a 32-year-old man who presented with anasarca. I show you this EKG because of the marked low voltage. The chest X-ray shows a big, big heart. And so first thought was pericardial effusion. When you get the echo, you see no pericardial effusion. And, um, and when you look again at the M mode, uh, mitral M mode, you'll find this paradoxical septal motion, again, indicative of RV volume overload. When we look at the RV inflow, you don't see, you see a little bit of uh, a tricuspid apparatus uh, here. You don't see a lot of coaptation. Uh, when we look at the uh, short axis here, you're seeing some of the aortic valve and some of the LVOT here, uh, but you don't really see any good leaflet uh, um, structure here. There is something, uh, on the, on the left side of the screen somewhat here. When you look in the apical four chamber, there are, um, there is certainly a lot of tricuspid regurgitation. So this patient, this patient had um, gone for uh, tricuspid valve replacement. And at the time of surgery, uh, the surgeon mentioned that the entire area was chewed up by prior endocarditis. So it's important to uh, be able to recognize um, when patients have had surgeries. And so some useful tips, a midline sternotomy, always good. Uh, so, but for patients who've had repeat uh, valve surgeries, you should look for the right lateral thoracotomy. So if the surgeon does not initially close up the pericardium, it can be very adherent and a redo of the tricuspid or, or a redo surgery where you tackle the tricuspid valve can be quite challenging from the, a midline, uh, repeat midline incision. So look for a right lateral thoracotomy or a minimally invasive uh, scar. How about grading tricuspid regurgitation? So this is something that we uh, do every day in our echo labs around the world. And we look at the color signal and we say, how much TR is there? So if I let you think about that um, to yourself and, and think how much you might call that, I think it, it would be very instructive to show you the CW across the valve. So whatever you thought this was, if you see this jet, it's very triangularized with rapid equalization of RA and RV pressures. And this is seen in patients who have severe uh, uh, grade of regurgitation. So again, a dense triangular jet. And a lot of times the peak is less than two or two and a half uh, um, meters per second, particularly in massive tricuspid regurgitation. For those with mild tricuspid regurgitation, you're going to get a parabolic jet. It may be faint. Um, and then for moderate, you'll definitely have the para parabolic contour, but it will be a little bit more dense. There's another case. This is a 30-year-old man with a known congenital heart abnormality. However, the patient did not know what that abnormality was. E the EKG shows a little bit of right atrial enlargement uh, to give you a clue. Uh, the chest X-ray shows um, a, a um, enlarged right heart border. There is not splaying of the tracheal carina. So uh, that also gives you some clues here. And then here we are in the short axis of the LV, um, but we are, uh, but we kind of are surprised. You never really see the tricuspid valve this well, uh, where the anterior leaflet here on top, posterior leaflet on the bottom, and then septal leaflet here along the interventricular septal edge. So uh, this is a patient. Um, when we go look into the apical views, you can see the tricuspid valve leaflets here. 
uh, and here. There is coaptation apparent here and, and maybe a failure of coaptation on the left panel. So what might this be? Uh, well, color can be very, very helpful here. And so when we put the color on, you can see that the jet of TR originates well inside the RV chamber, in the middle of the RV chamber, right? So when this happens, this is uh, diagnostic of Epstein anomaly. So in Epstein anomaly, let's look at the normal tricuspid valve development. When the valve develops, again, it has a papillary muscle attachment to the leaflet, and it has, importantly, these direct uh, myocardium or, or, or septal uh, attachments to the valve itself. In Epstein anomaly, there is failure of delamination of the valve from the wall. So the wall and the leaflet are adherent to each other. And it's again, a failed delamination. This delamination occurs, that fails occurs in, um, in the septal and posterior leaflets for Epstein anomaly. And there can be variable amount of failure of delamination. In fact, the, the right ventricle can, can be variably present. And if it, it's not, then there's no contractile forces here. And this is the atrialized portion of the right ventricle. One thing that also happens uh, with the tricuspid valve orifice in Epstein's is that here in the black uh, circle here is the normal uh, anatomic annulus for, for patients. Uh, but in Epstein anomaly, you can get any one of these green ellipses as being the functional uh, tricuspid annulus. There is a hinge point at the septum, but the annulus can move anywhere and can even move into the RV outflow tract, as was shown by one of the speakers earlier today. So some five points to remember, it's the septal and posterior leaflets that are adherent to the myocardium due to failed delamination. The functional annulus is rotated apically with a hinge point at the septum. The anterior leaflet becomes elongated. The anatomic annulus becomes dilated. And then the RV subtended by the anatomic and functional tricuspid annuli may be variably, variably thinned and atrialized. Next case, uh, this is a 47-year-old woman with dyspnea and a holosystolic murmur, increasing in intensity on inspiration. You can see here that uh, in the RV inflow, the anterior leaflet is shown here, uh, does not coapt very well, and that there is significant tenting of the, um, of the valve. This is a patient who had chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, they certainly have severe tricuspid regurgitation, but that tenting and the tenting area uh, are significant in this patient. Just to, just to back up a little bit, this, uh, this annulus, uh, importantly, is not terribly dilated. If you use the scale of centimeters here, it is less than 40 millimeters across, uh, uh, which is, again, compatible with pulmonary hypertension. If we look at the inferior vena cava, you can see this orange signal uh, during systole, which is con uh, confirmed by pulse wave Doppler of the hepatic vein. You can see systolic flow reversal, uh, a very specific sign for, the, for severe grade of tricuspid regurgitation. This is a chart of all of the qualitative, semi-quantitative, and quantitative uh, parameters for tricuspid regurgitation grading. Uh, the ones in bold are specific uh, uh, findings for that grade. I'll call your attention uh, here to the quantitative part of the chart. Uh, note that the EROA, if you measure it by PISA or by 3D, have different criteria for severe. 40 being um, 40 millimeters squared being severe by PISA, 75 by 3D. The regurgitant volume by PISA is different from, um, from that of the mitral valve in that uh, 45 and above uh, indicates a severe regurgitant volume. The EROA, however, is the same as the uh, mitral valve uh, by PISA method. So just uh, so don't get faked out on this uh, 
uh, on these numerical parameters. Okay, so there's a, again, a lot of effort spent on, on assessing the right ventricular systolic pressure using tricuspid regurgitation. So let's look at some do's and don'ts here. So uh, certainly you should choose a window that gives you the most parallel uh, uh, angle to uh, interrogate the TR jet. Importantly, you should set the sweep speed to 75 to 150 meter, uh, millimeters per second, according to the heart rate. For those patients with arrhythmias, uh, avoid using post-PVC beats. And in patients with AFib, what you want are, is a fairly stable R to R interval. And when you find two beats like that, you should measure the third beat um, to, to get your TR jet. Uh, you want to optimize signal to noise ratio by carefully adjusting the Doppler gain uh, and, and certainly not overestimate uh, the maximal velocities. If you can't see the tip of the TR jet, you should avoid reporting it uh, or over reporting it as this will lead to inaccuracy. And one of the biggest thing, biggest errors that I think is made on a day-to-day -day basis is that we don't measure the peak TR velocity using the modal frequency. Uh, and we'll take a look at that. Um, it's important to, uh, to recognize as well that you can administer saline bubbles uh, while you are doing CW across the tricuspid valve and the bubbles passing through will improve the jet contour uh, allowing you to, to measure the peak uh, TR signal. And then finally, you should avoid translational motion when assessing the IBC. So if the red dash line uh, represents your 2D view with your transducer on the patient um, uh, in, the, in the subcostal view, uh, so this is what you see at rest. When the patient sniffs, what may happen, you, you, you feel that you're hand has not moved and your probe has not moved, but what has in fact moved is that the IVC has shifted to the side. And what can appear uh, in your, on your screen as a smaller or a perhaps 50% or more um, a reduction in diameter is in fact erroneous. And so you have to be aware of uh, this idea. If you, if you see severe, severe tricuspid regurgitation, it would really be somewhat odd for the IBC uh, to, um, to be collapsible with, uh, with inspiration. So let's look at some TR jet measurements. So this is a patient with a, a lot of tricuspid regurgitation as seen here on the color. Um, what we often find is that our techs try to reach for the stars and, and find a point that I always say that their eyesight is much better than mine. Uh, and they seem to find the tips uh, much further away than, than what I do. But uh, th this is the red arrow here is an incorrect assessment of the tricuspid regurgitation peak. Uh, you should be careful to not overestimate um, and, and if you use what's called the modal uh, frequency, you will find that you will, you will find the right answer um, a lot of the time. So you can see here that there's this jet within a jet, and these velocities here represent the modal frequency. The modal frequency is often shown as a shell around, the, um, around whatever jet you're interrogating. So these green arrows show the correct uh, measurement locations for the TR jet. For patients who have advanced lung disease and pulmonary hypertension, uh, uh, they may have. It is it is very important uh, to get a good assessment of the right ventricular systolic pressure and pulmonary artery systolic pressures. Uh, so, uh, but unfortunately, the majority of the time they have they don't have a good jet. They have this moderate moderately uh, present jet or a very degraded poor jet. Uh, so we definitely need to employ tricks in this patient population to get the TR jet to be optimal. So here's such an example. This is a patient referred uh, for assessment of um, the PA systolic pressure. And this is the kind of jet that we get. If you look at this, the, the jet is less than, it appears to be less than three meters per second. So there are a lot of buttons on the side here of the screen. And 
you know, you can mess around with these uh, and, and cause trouble, or you can use them effectively to get where you're going. So what happens if we increase the gain? So on the next slide, we'll see what happens when we in slide this bar all the way and we increase the gain. So the TR jet gets certainly uh, better. Uh, so that's good. All right, so there are more buttons here. What about if we adjust the 2D gain? So if we increase the 2D gain, what happens? Well, that changes the gain up here and does nothing for the spectral Doppler gain. So the 2D gain uh, changes things up here and really isn't uh, effective at what we're looking at. So we'll reset that back down this way. All right, what happens if we increase the compress setting? So there's some buttons here, compress and reject. Uh, the compression is also is a also known as dynamic range. So if we increase the compression or the dynamic range, uh, let's see what happens. So then you get a much brighter uh, jet, but you also increase. So your signal increases, but your noise increases as well. What happens if we increase the reject setting? So the reject setting filters out a lot of this extraneous. Um, uh, grayscale uh, um, uh, on the screen. And so let's look at that. And so now you get this nice uh, contour here. So if we look where we started uh, to where we are after those adjustments, now we can see that the jet is above three fairly reliably, and, uh, and we can have a, a, a good chance of measuring the peak. We're not quite yet done with the, with the optimization. So one thing that we do, so this is the jet here as we have it, and this is at a sweep speed of 50 millimeters per second. Uh, and you can see that down here, it's labeled 50. Um, if we increase it, so this is the next level of 66, you can see that the jet spreads out and you can get a good understanding of where the tip might be. And you can spread that out between, again, 75 and 150 seems to be ideal to be confident where you're going to put that line to make your measurement. All right, so these are our optimis final optimizations and, and to get us confident assessment of the tricuspid valve jet. Uh, there are some pitfalls. So if you slow the sweep speed, for example, you make it 25 instead of um, what's recommended, then these jets get to be very, very small and you can end up uh, visually overestimating the jet um, uh, because, because your eye wants to make this kind of triangular. Similarly, if you have the Doppler limit, uh, the scale uh, set too high, so instead of four, let's say six or eight, every little bit that you move down is a bigger change um, in error uh, in, the, in the pressure assessment. So you want this jet, uh, you want this, sorry, scale to be appropriate for your anticipated peak um, and, and the uh, sweep speed set appropriately. How about those saline bubbles? So if you start out with this jet, uh, this the signal in A, and while you are conducting CW across the, the valve, uh, you administer bubbles. What you'll see is these little bubbles will whiz by, causing these little streaks here. And as this is very early on, but they start to make a contour here. And so uh, with more as as more bubbles pass, and and you're at the peak of the of the bubble study you really get a nice contour from which you can confidently assess the, um, the, the velocity. You can't assess the, you can't use this to say this is a very dense jet of, uh, of regurgitation to say that this is severe, but you can um, use the, the peak with confidence. All right, with the remaining time, we'll talk about the other uh, lesions on the right side. So for tricuspid stenosis, the usual cause worldwide is rheumatic. Uh, carcinoid, uh, has, as has been mentioned throughout this course, is typically what we see. We see the combination of TS and TR because the uh, leaflets are thickened and retracted, uh, as is the subvalvular uh, apparatus. And so the leaflets kind of become fixed in a semi-open position. 
Recall that the normal mean gradient is less than two uh, millimeters of mercury. Uh, importantly, when you're measuring tricuspid stenosis, you should measure uh, when the patient is breath holding in end expiration. And again, because we're trying to see uh, between two, three, four, five, six, seven millimeters of mercury, when you, uh, when you inspire, you increase venous return, and this, uh, again, ultimately leads to an, a slight uptick in the, in the gradient. So end expiration is the place, is the timing in the respiratory cycle to make the measurement. The formula, again, is 190 divided by the pressure half time. This is what is suggested. Uh, and then severe TS uh, occurs when the mean gradient is five, certainly above seven, depending on who you read. Some people say five, some people say seven is the cutoff, but certainly above seven um, or a pressure half time above 190. Here's one example of uh, carcinoid. You can see these leaflets look uh, like they have reduced mobility. They don't really have a good excursion. Certainly there's a, a ton of tricuspid regurgitation and with a triangularized jet. Uh, here is a second example of, of uh, carcinoid uh, involving the tricuspid valve. Uh, if you look in the, this bottom panel here, again, the anterior leaflet is shown. And because you see the interventricular septum so well, with confidence, this is the septal leaflet. So here, the septal leaflet has really no excursion. Uh, well, how can you uh, differentiate this from uh, Epstein? Well, if you look at the source of where the uh, tricuspid regurgitation starts, it starts where you would expect it. It's not terribly deep inside the RV. Uh, and so this, this really uh, uh, does not fit with Epstein. Uh, here's an example of Epstein, uh, again, for comparison. So here in the green circle in the, in the RV inflow view, you can see an elongated uh, anterior leaflet the blue arrow points to the anatomic annulus. You can see the septal leaflet stretching down. Uh, you can see on the right top panel that the tricuspid regurgitation starts well inside the RV cavity, and that is your clue uh, for Epstein. In the short axis, you can see that the septal leaflet here in the red circle is plastered against the interventricular septum. And again, the TR jet starts uh, uh, in a different place than you would expect uh, normally. How about the pulmonic valve? All right, well, the leaflets, there are three leaflets and they, they are le uh, named left, right, and anterior. So the left and right are named uh, in correspondence with the left and right valve um, uh, leaflets of the aortic valve. Uh, when you have pulmonic stenosis, uh, whether it's subvalvular, valvular, supravalvular, or branch, uh, this is almost always congenital in origin. The leaflets are not calcified, they're called dysplastic. So don't look for calcium like you would look for aortic stenosis. Uh, but similar to aortic stenosis, you can have post stenotic dilatation of the PA. You may find that the highest gradient is seen in the subcostal window. You don't have a whole lot of great views, whether it's transthoracic or transesophageal for the pulmonic valve, um, but the subcostal uh, may give you a, uh, allow you the opportunity for a very parallel jet. As far as which leaflet you're looking at, uh, typically in this view, the left leaflet is closest to the left coronary cusp of the aortic valve and then the opposite one tends to be the anterior leaflet if you see the opposite one. With regard to the uh, hemodynamic numbers for pulmonic stenosis grading, uh, once you get, to, if you're less than three, uh, that's considered mild, but once you get to three, you are in the kind of moderate range and then above four meters per second or 64 millimeters of mercury would constitute severe PS. Uh, here, so here is an example of a transpulmonic CW across the pulmonic valve. And so your gradient here, again, be careful at overestimating 
right? You still want to use some of these modal uh, velocities and and just be just try to get confident. There's some above, some below. You may want to take the one in the middle. So this is jet is around three, which would be uh, mild pulmonic stenosis. This is an image from uh, uh, from Can uh, Catherine Otto uh, showing the flying W that is seen. Uh, that can be seen on M mode, as was discussed uh, by Dr. Garg in a uh, prior lecture very nicely. Uh, I want to point out there's early systolic notching that you can see on pulse wave Doppler of the right ventricular outflow tract. And this is indicative of high pulmonary vascular resistance as seen in pulmonary arterial hypertension. So look for this notching in the RVOT pulse wave Doppler. How about pulmonic stenosis in pregnancy? Let's talk about what you find. So this uh, PS, even when severe, is generally well tolerated during pregnancy. Severe PS can cause some trouble with RV failure and arrhythmias. You may uh, have preterm birth or rarely infant uh, mortality. Uh, if uh, prior to pregnancy, uh, you, the patient, you know the patient has PS, then you can relieve the PS with a balloon valvuloplasty if the peak gradient is above 64. So mild and, and moderate are, are not really uh, done with a balloon valvuloplasty. Uh, you have to wait till it ripens to severe. So patients with mild to moderate PS are regarded as low risk for continuing their pregnancy. And balloon valvuloplasty during the pregnancy is only indicated if they're unresponsive to medical therapy and bed rest. Vaginal delivery is the preferred route of uh, delivery for these patients. Pulmonic valve endocarditis seems to be very, very, very uncommon. Um, here's one case um, where you can see the vegetation moving on the pulmonary valve and the uh, resultant regurgitation uh, in, this, in this TEE view. Here's, a, here's another patient uh, where we are assessing the pulmonic valve and ask yourself, what do you see? What do you see on the, um, uh, on the uh, uh, 2D as well as the color Doppler uh, view? Do you, do you see anything to be concerned about? So if you're, if you're not sure what you're looking at, um, you know, color M mode can always be a great way to time things. I see a lot of orange and blue, but it's important when, it, when it's all happening. So if we do color M mode, we can see that there's a blue flow normally uh, seen here in systole, and then followed by an orange flow, and then the cycle repeats with blue, orange, blue, orange. The shades of blue and, and orange are those that are closest uh, to the um, kind of the center of the Nyquist band. And so these are indicate laminar flow. And so there's laminar flow through the valve uh, in systole and then back into the RV during diastole. And this to and fro movement indicates wide open pulmonic regurgitation. Uh, so one of the things that you typically look at in, um, in such patients for, for severe pulmonic regurgitation is you're supposed to look at how there is orange flow or red flow in the main PA or the, the branches uh, to give you confidence that there is severe PI. But there are, but sometimes you can't see the branch uh, PAs or the main PA very, very well. And so there are two situations uh, in, in which in the subcostal, sorry, in the short axis view, you want the color sector as wide as it can be. And those two situations are severe PI or tricuspid stenosis. So those are the two that you really want the sector as wide as can be. And you can almost see this kind of circular flow. This patient certainly has a lot of tricuspid regurgitation as well, but that um, the, you, you can see this kind of wide flow here. So keep that in mind. Yes, if you see the orange in the, in the main PA during diastole, uh, that, that does, uh, that, that is certainly compatible with severe PI, but you don't always see it. So let's move back on to the questions. Uh, so question number one, unlike the relationship 
of uh, the aortic and mitral valve leaflets. Uh, it is uncommon to see direct extension of the tricuspid, of tricuspid valve endocarditis to the pulmonic valve to the presence of what anatomic structure? And I think uh, most of you are, are saying uh, the ventricular infundibular fold. That is the correct answer. All right. That is the also known as this uh, crista supraventricularis. Uh, the crista terminalis is in the right atrium. All right. Next. Let's see. Uh, so B is the right answer. All right. Uh, question two, which of the following is least effective in improving right ventricular systolic uh, pressure assessment accuracy from the following TR jet uh, envelope? So set the sweep speed to 100, increase the 2D gain, increase the dynamic range, uh, administer saline bubbles, or decrease the Doppler scale. And folks are saying correctly uh, that B is the correct answer. When you increase the 2D gain, you're only fixing this image on top. The sweep speed here should be changed from 50 to above 75. And then this Doppler scale should be reduced from six to four uh, to, to give you better accuracy, all right? Which of the following is correct regarding typical findings associated with Epstein anomaly? Septal and anterior leaflet fusion resulting in TR, RV laminated, sail like anterior tricuspid leaflet, decreased size of the anatomic annulus, apical rotation of the functional tricuspid annulus, or increased RV volume. And uh, you guys are saying, some are saying D and some are saying B. All right, so this is a, a little bit of a tricky question. The correct answer here is, um, is D. Apical rotation of the functional annulus. I showed you that slide with the green ellipses going towards the uh, RV apex and RVOT. Why is B wrong? Well, you absolutely do get a sail like anterior tricuspid valve leaflet, but it is not laminated to the RV. The septal and posterior leaflets have a failure of delamination in Epstein anomaly, but the right, uh, but the, um, the anterior leaflet is, uh, is normally uh, not adherent. So the RV lamination means that the anterior leaflet would be adherent, but that is not the case in Epstein. All right, so uh, question number four, a patient diagnosed recently with a small anterior leaflet tricuspid vegetation, which, which view is most likely to show the anterior leaflet? Uh, RV inflow, Short axis, apical RV uh, focused, apical three, apical four. And so the answers are here, A, the RV parasternal view, that's correct. So that, so the apical four chamber reliably uh, shows the um, septal leaflet and the RV inflow reliably shows the anterior leaflet. Next question. What is the cause of the blue Doppler signal in the subpulmonic RVOT region on this TTE? PR with uh, inverted Nyquist, PR with too low Nyquist limit and aliasing, VSD associated with trisomy 21 or Downs, VSD associated with tetralogy of Fallot or something else. Interested to see what you guys say. Sorry. So uh, you guys, uh, let's see, some of you have said A. All right, so let's see. Um, so let's take a look at this, okay? So PR with inverted Nyquist, all right? So um, that could be, but the, I, the, the blue jet could represent PR, but what you are seeing here in this Nyquist scale is that orange is on the top and blue is on the bottom. That is exactly the standard v, uh, uh, display for Nyquist in transthoracic echo. So the, the invert, the Nyquist is not inverted here. How about too low a Nyquist and this is aliasing? So the Nyquist is set well, this is 71. And so if it were half that, you might get some uh, uh, aliasing of color and what might be normally orange might might circle back to become blue. So uh, that is not the case here because the Nyquist is set appropriately. VSD associated with trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. 
So in Down syndrome, remember the VSD that you get is an inlet VSD. So an inlet VSD, that's over here. Uh, that is, you're never really going to see an, a VSD from Downs show up on this side. Uh, with Tetralogy of Fallot, you get an outlet or supracrystal VSD, and that could show up in this view. However, if that were happening, the color here would be orange. If you look on this spectral Doppler tracing during systole, you really don't see any flow backwards uh, in, in CW here. Uh, to to um, give you the idea that this is this is uh, systolic flow backwards into the RVOT. Color M mode here shows a lot of turbulence in the RVOT and then normal outflow during systole. So this is kind of what you would expect. The the blue going out the pulmonic valve is certainly normal. It's this green jet that's in uh, diastole that's abnormal within the RVOT. Again, you don't see any reversal of flow in the main PA or the branch PAs. So this is less likely to be pulmonic regurgitation. All right, so what is this? So then what is, so let's, uh, this is something else. So let's take a look at what this is. So I mentioned, so if we start up here, this is what we were looking at. If we widen the color sector in the top right panel, you'll start to see that there's some turbulence uh, on this side of the, uh, of the right ventricle. If we look at the tricuspid valve, you can see that there is turbulence going across in diastole. And so this is, again, diastolic flow. This is not systolic flow uh, from a VSD. And so this is tricuspid stenosis. So I mentioned that there are two times when you want the color sector to be super wide, and that's severe PI and, uh, and significant tricuspid stenosis. So here you can see that the orange jet comes in, hits the wall here, and as it goes towards the pulmonic valve, it changes direction and becomes a blue going towards the pulmonic valve in diastole. So this is a manifestation of severe TS. Tricky hard and hard question. All right, so our next question uh, is there's a 29-year-old woman in her second trimester of pregnancy. She has uh, this CW tracing across the pulmonic valve. What do we do with the pregnancy? So this is pulmonic stenosis. Um, and because it's in that three or just above three range, uh, this is considered mild to moderate PS or mild PS, and this is no biggie. You can continue the pregnancy without worry. Um, the gradient would have to be above 64 to think about valvuloplasty. Uh, termination, again, pregnancy during even severe PS is generally well tolerated. And again, if, if you were thinking that this was a VSD, the jet would be opposite uh, to the baseline. All right. Question seven. Uh, a 30-year-old woman status with tetralogy of flow repair with bioprosthetic uh, valve. Images shown are from the standard parasternal windows. Based upon the images, which of the following is least likely to be found? RV hypokinesis, sinus rhythm, TS and TR, PS and PR, elevate RVDP, RA pressure above PA diastolic pressure before the S1 heart sound, or all the above are demonstrated. So what do you guys say? So some, some of you have, uh, let's see. Okay, so let's, let's take a look here. Uh, G, sorry, whoops, that was the wrong mouse. So G, okay. So the correct answer is TS and TR is least likely to be found. And, and so based upon your knowledge of, tetra, of the four things in tetralogy of Fallot, the tricuspid valve is not affected. So it is unlikely that a bioprosthetic valve would have been put in to the tricuspid position. So TS and T are extremely unlikely. So let's, uh, let's let this run a little bit. Let, let's take choice A, RV hypokinesis. Do you see RV hypokinesis in the parasternal view here, the parasternal long? I, I, I would say so. Um, 
How about sinus rhythm? So in the next view, you see in the mitral M mode, an E and A, and yeah, this is a little bit artifactual here, but there's an E and A, E and A. And this is sinus rhythm. So, or very compatible with uh, sinus rhythm. So this, so A and B are, are, are demonstrated here. Um, if, we, if we skip down to this at bottom left panel, um, what you find is that there is a high velocity systolic jet followed by a triangular uh, diastolic jet. And so when you think about what causes that, um, that would fit most uh, from the view and from, from the direction, from the, principally from the direction of flow, um, pulmonic stenosis and pulmonic regurgitation. Okay, so we'll talk about uh, E and F on the next slide here. So uh, how about, so what we see here is a very steep slope of the pulmonic regurgitation jet, and you can see that repeatedly here. So at the end of the pulmonic regurgitation jet, the RV diastolic pressure equalizes with the PA diastolic and flow stops. Uh, you can see that that's well, and that flow stops before the onset of the QRS. And then what we have is that we have this situation where there is additional flow in the red circle uh, out of the pulmonic valve. And the only way this can happen is when you have the atrial kick and the right atrial pressure then exceeds the RV pressure, which then exceeds the PA diastolic pressure. Uh, the S1 heart sound is, uh, is, it heralds the onset of systole. And so this is uh, opening of the PA, uh, of the pulmonic valve in late diastole. Uh, and this is seen in severe pulmonic regurgitation. The same, the same Doppler tracings can be seen in severe aortic regurgitation. And if you look at the normal PI jet, uh, you have here the atrial kick, which is above the baseline, not uh, below the baseline. All right. And these are the final questions. Uh, diastolic tricuspid BTI of 30, does it mean severe TS? Uh, the answer to that is no. Um, 60 is the cutoff for that BTI. How about the pressure halftime of less than 190? 190 is correct, but it is greater than 190, right? Your, your calculation, your formula is 190 divided by the pressure halftime. So to get a valve area of less than one, your pressure halftime has to be greater than 190. How about a uh, regurgitant volume of 50 cc's per beat? Does this mean severe TR? Uh, yes. 45 is the, is the threshold value for uh, differentiating moderate from severe. So that is correct. So on behalf of the Imaging Society of Louisiana Subcommittee of the Louisiana Chapter of the American College of Cardiology, uh, thank you for this opportunity to present this topic to you. Thank you for your dedication to CV imaging quality. Good luck on your echo boards and certification matters. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Jen. That was a phenomenal talk. I don't see any questions in the chat box. All right. So is that, it's either clear as mud or everybody is at lunch. I'll say it's clear as mud. Thank you very much, Nidesh. That was an excellent review. Very, very informative. Thank you very much for doing this. Really appreciate your contribution. Thank, Thank you. you, my all pleasure. For joining us. Thank you all for joining us on this uh, Saturday. We appreciate you all joining. We'll see you all tomorrow. Again, the review of topics tomorrow is mainly focused on the physics and the basics, and we will be starting at 9 a.m. sharp. See you all tomorrow. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Goodbye.